Section 1 of Homeric Hymns, Epigrams, and Battle of Frogs and Mice. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Homeric Hymns, Epigrams, and Battle of Frogs and Mice by Homer. Translated by Hugh G. Evelyn White. Section 1. To Dionysus. For some say at Dracanum, and some on windy Icarus, and some in Naxos, O oh, heaven-born in Syune, and others in the deep-eddying river Alpheus, that pregnant semele bear you to Zeus the thunder-lover. And others yet, Lord, say you were born in Thebes, but all these lie. The father of men and gods gave you birth remote from men and secretly from the white-armed Hera. There is a certain Nysa, a mountain most high and richly grown with woods, far off in Phoenice, near the streams of Egyptus. And men will lay up for her many offerings in her shrines, and as these things are three, so shall mortals ever sacrifice perfect hecatombs to you at your feasts each three years. The son of Cronos spoke and nodded with his dark brows, and the divine locks of the king flowed forward from his immortal head, and he made great Olympus reel. So spake wise Zeus, and ordained it with a nod. Be favourable, O Insoon, inspirer of frenzied women. We singers sing of you as we begin and as we end a strain, and none forgetting you may call holy song to mind. And so farewell, Dionysus, Insoon, with your mother Semele, whom men call Thyone. End of section 1《Section 2 of Homeric Hymns, Epigrams, and Battle of Frogs and Mice by Homer, translated by Hugh G. Evelyn White, Section 2 of Homeric Hymns, Epigrams, and Battle of Frogs and Mice by Homer, translated by Hugh G. Evelyn White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To Demeter I begin to sing of rich-haired Demeter, awful goddess, of her and her trim-ankled daughter, whom Idoneus wrapped away, given to him by all-seeing Zeus the loud thunderer. Apart from Demeter, lady of the golden sword and glorious fruits, she was playing with the deep-bosomed daughters of Oceanus and gathering flowers over a soft meadow, roses and crocuses and beautiful violets, irises also, and hyacinths and the narcissus, which earth made to grow at the will of Zeus and to please the host of many, to be a snare for the bloom-like girl, a marvellous, radiant flower. It was a thing of awe whether for deathless gods or mortal men to see. From its root grew a hundred blooms, and it smelled most sweetly, so that all wide heaven above and the whole earth in the sea's salt swell laughed for joy. And the girl was amazed, and reached out with both hands to take the lovely toy. But the wide-pathed earth yawned there in the plain of Nysa, and the Lord, host of many, with his immortal horses, sprang out upon her, the son of Cronos, he who has many names. He caught her up reluctant on his golden car, and bare her away lamenting. Then she cried out shrilly with her voice, calling upon her father, the son of Cronos, who is most high and excellent. But no one, either of the deathless gods or of mortal men, heard her voice, nor yet the olive trees bearing rich fruit. Only tender-hearted Hecate, bright-coiffed the daughter of Perseus, heard the girl from her cave and the Lord Helios, Hyperion's bright son, as she cried to her father, the son of Cronos. But he was sitting aloof, apart from the gods, in his temple where many pray, and receiving sweet offerings from mortal men. So he, that son of Cronos of many names, who is ruler of many and host of many, was bearing her away by leave of Zeus on his immortal chariot, his own brother's child, and all unwilling. And so long as she, the goddess, yet beheld earth and starry heaven and the strong flowing sea where fishes shoal and the rays of the sun and still hoped to see her dear mother and the tribes of the eternal gods, so long hope calmed her great heart for all her trouble. And the heights of the mountains and the depths of the sea rang with her immortal voice and her queenly mother heard her. Bitter pain seized her heart and she rent the covering upon her divine hair with her dear hands, 
her dark cloak she cast down from both her shoulders and sped like a wild bird over the firm land and yielding sea seeking her child but no one would tell her the truth neither god nor mortal man and of the birds of omen none came with true news for her then for nine days queenly dio wandered over the earth with flaming torches in her hands so grieved that she never tasted ambrosia and the sweet draught of nectar nor sprinkled her body with water but when the tenth enlightening dawn had come hecate with a torch in her hands met her and spoke to her and told her the news queenly demeter bringer of seasons and giver of good gifts what god of heaven or what mortal man has rapt away persephone and pierced with sorrow your dear heart for i heard her voice yet saw not with my eyes who it was but i tell you truly and shortly all i know so then said achate and the daughter of rich-haired rhea answered her not but sped swiftly with her holding flaming torches in her hands so they came to helios who was watchman of both gods and men and stood in front of his horses and the bright goddess inquired of him helios do you at least regard me goddess as i am if ever by word or deed of mine i have cheered your heart and spirit through the fruitless air i heard the thrilling cry of my daughter whom i bear sweet scion of my body and lovely in form as of one seized violently though with my eyes i saw nothing but you for with your beams you look down from the bright upper air over all the earth and sea tell me truly of my dear child if you have seen her anywhere what god or mortal man has violently seized her against her will and mine and so made off so said she and the son of hyperion answered her queen demeter daughter of rich-haired rhea i will tell you the truth for i greatly reverence and pity you in your grief for your trim-ankled daughter none other of the deathless gods is to blame but only cloud-gathering zeus who gave her to hades her father's brother to be called his buxom wife and hades seized her and took her loudly crying in his chariot down to his realm of mist and gloom yet goddess cease your loud lament and keep not vain anger unrelentingly idonius the ruler of many is no unfitting husband among the deathless gods for your child being your own brother and born of the same stock also for honour he has that third share which he received when division was made at the first and is appointed lord of those among whom he dwells so he spake and called to his horses and at his chiding they quickly whirled the swift chariot along like long-winged birds but grief yet more terrible and savage came into the heart of demeter and thereafter she was so angered with the dark clouded son of Cronos that she avoided the gathering of the gods and high olympus and went to the towns and rich fields of men disfiguring her form a long while and no one of men or deep-bosomed women knew her when they saw her until she came to the house of wise Calius, who was then lord of fragrant eleusis vexed in her dear heart she sat near the wayside by the maiden well from which the women of the place were used to draw water in a shady place over which grew an olive shrub and she was like an ancient woman who was cut off from childbearing and the gifts of garland-loving aphrodite like the nurses of king's children who deal justice or like the housekeepers in their echoing halls there the daughters of Calius, son of eleusis saw her as they were coming for easy drawn water to carry it in pitchers of bronze to their dear father's house four were they and like goddesses in the flower of their girlhood Calidike and Clesidike and lovely demo and calithoe who was the eldest of them all they knew her not for the gods are not easily discerned by mortals but standing near by her spoke winged words old mother whence and who are you of folk born long ago why are you gone away from the city and do not draw near the houses for there in the shady halls are women of just such age as you and others younger and they would welcome you both by word and by deed thus they said and she that queen among goddesses answered them saying hail dear children 
whosoever you are of womankind, I will tell you my story, for it is not unseemly that I should tell you truly what you ask. Doso is my name, for my stately mother gave it me, and now I am come from Crete over the sea's wide back, not willingly, but against my liking, by force of strength. Pirates brought me thence. Afterwards they put in with their swift craft to Thoricus, and there the women landed on the shore in full throng, and the men likewise, and they began to make ready a meal by the stern cables of the ship. But my heart craved not pleasant food, and I fled secretly across the dark country and escaped my masters, that they should not take me unpurchased across the sea, there to win a price for me. And so I wandered, and am come here, and I know not at all what land this is, or what people are in it. But may all those who dwell on Olympus give you husbands, and birth of children as parents desire. So you take pity on me, maidens, and show me this clearly that I may learn, dear children, to the house of what man and woman I may go, to work for them cheerfully, at such tasks as belong to a woman of my age. Well could I nurse a newborn child, holding him in my arms, or keep house, or spread my master's bed in a recess of the well-built chamber, or teach the women their work. So said the goddess, and straightway the unwed maiden Kalidiki, goodliest in form of the daughters of Calius, answered her, and said, Mother, what the gods send us we mortals bear perforce, although we suffer, for they are much stronger than we. But now I will teach you clearly, telling you the names of men who have great power and honour here, and are chief among the people, guarding our city's coif of towers by their wisdom and true judgments. There is wise Triptolemus, and Diocles, and Polyxenus, and blameless Eumolpus, and Dolichus, and our own brave father. All these have wives you manage in the house, and no one of them, so soon as she had seen you, would dishonour you and turn you from the house, but they will welcome you, for indeed you are godlike. But if you will, stay here, and we will go to our father's house and tell Metanira, our deep-bosomed mother, all this matter fully, that she may bid you rather come to our home than search after the houses of others. She has an only son, late born, who is being nursed in our well-built house, a child of many prayers and welcome. If you could bring him up until he reached the full measure of youth, any one of womankind who should see you would straightway envy you. Such gifts would our mother give you for his upbringing. So she spake, and the goddess bowed her head in assent. And they filled her shining vessels with water and carried them off rejoicing. Quickly they came to their father's great house and straightway told their mother according as they had heard and seen. Then she bade them go with all speed, and invite the stranger to come for a measureless hire. As hinds or heifers in springtime, when sated with pasture, bound about a meadow, so they, holding up the folds of their lovely garments, darted down the hollow path, and their hair like a crocus flower streamed about their shoulders. And they found the good goddess near the wayside where they had left her before, and led her to the house of their dear father and she walked behind, distressed in her dear heart, with her head veiled, and wearing a dark cloak, which waved about the slender feet of the goddess. Soon they came to the house of heaven-nurtured Calius, and went through the portico to where their queenly mother sat by a pillar of the close-fitted roof, holding her son a tender scion in her bosom. And the girls ran to her. But the goddess walked to the threshold, and her head reached the roof, and she filled the doorway with a heavenly radiance. Then awe and reverence and pale fear took hold of Metanera, and she rose up from her couch before Demeter, and bade her be seated. But Demeter, bringer of seasons and giver of perfect gifts, would not sit upon the bright couch, but stayed silent with lovely eyes cast down, until careful Iambi placed a jointed seat for her and threw over it a silvery fleece. Then she sat down and held her veil in her hands before her face. A long time she sat upon the stool without speaking because of her sorrow, and greeted no one by word or by sign, but rested, never smiling, 
and tasting neither food nor drink, because she pined with longing for her deep-bosomed daughter, until careful Iambi, who pleased her moods in aftertime also, moved the holy lady with many a quip and jest to smile and laugh and cheer her heart. Then Metanira filled a cup with sweet wine and offered it to her, but she refused it, for she said it was not lawful for her to drink red wine, but bade them mix meal and water with soft mint and give her to drink. And Metanira mixed the draught and gave it to the goddess as she bade. So the great queen Deo received it to observe the sacrament. And of them all, well-girded Metanira first began to speak. Hail, lady! for I think you are not meanly but nobly born. Truly dignity and grace are conspicuous upon your eyes, as in the eyes of kings that deal justice. Yet we mortals bear perforce what the gods send us, though we be grieved, for a yoke is set upon our necks. But now, since you are come here, you shall have what I can bestow, and nurse me this child whom the gods gave me in my old age and beyond my hope, a son much prayed for. If you should bring him up until he reach the full measure of youth, any one of womankind that sees you will straightway envy you, so great reward would I give for his upbringing. Then rich-haired Demeter answered her, And to you also, lady, all hail, and may the gods give you good. Gladly I will take the boy to my breast, as you bid me, and will nurse him. Never, I ween, through any heedlessness of his nurse shall witchcraft hurt him, nor yet the undercutter. For I know a charm far stronger than the woodcutter, and I know an excellent safeguard against woeful witchcraft. When she had so spoken, she took the child in her fragrant bosom with her divine hands, and his mother was glad in her heart. So the goddess nursed in the palace de Mophun, wise Calius's goodly son, whom well-girded Metanira bare. And the child grew like some immortal being, not fed with food nor nourished at the breast. For by day, rich-crowned Demeter would anoint him with ambrosia as if he were the offspring of a god, and breathe sweetly upon him as she held him in her bosom. But at night she would hide him like a brand in the heart of the fire, unknown to his dear parents, and it wrought great wonder in these that he grew beyond his age, for he was like the gods face to face and she would have made him deathless and unaging had not well-girded Metanira in her heedlessness kept watch by night from her sweet-smelling chamber, and spied. But she wailed and smote her two hips, because she feared for her son, and was greatly distraught in her heart, so she lamented and uttered winged words, Demophon, my son, the strange woman buries you deep in fire, and works grief and bitter sorrow for me. Thus she spoke mourning, and the bright goddess, lovely crowned Demeter, heard her, and was wroth with her. So with her divine hands she snatched from the fire the dear son whom Metanira had borne unhoped for in the palace, and cast him from her to the ground, for she was terribly angry in her heart. Forthwith she said to well-girded Metanira, Witless are you mortals, and dull to foresee your lot, whether of good or evil, that comes upon you. For now in your heedlessness you have wrought folly past healing. For be witness the oath of the gods, the relentless water of Styx. I would have made your dear son deathless and unaging all his days, and would have bestowed on him everlasting honour. But now he can in no way escape death and the fates. Yet shall unfailing honour always rest upon him, because he lay upon my knees and slept in my arms. But as the years move round, and when he is in his prime, the sons of the Eleusians shall ever wage war and dead strife with one another continually. Lo, I am that Demeter, who has share of honour, and is the greatest help and cause of joy to the undying gods and mortal men. But now, let all the people build me a great temple, and an altar below it, and beneath the city and its sheer wall upon a rising hillock above Calichorus, and I myself will teach my rites, that hereafter you may reverently perform them, and so win the favour of my heart. When she had so said,
the goddess changed her stature and her looks, thrusting old age away from her. Beauty spread round about her, and a lovely fragrance was wafted from her sweet-smelling robes, and from the divine body of the goddess a light shone afar, while golden tresses spread down over her shoulders, so that the strong house was filled with brightness as with lightning. And so she went out from the palace. And straight away Metanira's knees were loosed, and she remained speechless for a long while, and did not remember to take up her late-born son from the ground. But his sisters heard his pitiful wailing, and sprang down from their well-spread beds. One of them took up the child in her arms, and laid him in her bosom, while another revived the fire, and a third rushed with soft feet to bring her mother from her fragrant chamber. And they gathered about the struggling child and washed him, embracing him lovingly. But he was not comforted, because nurses and handmaids much less skilful were holding him now. All night long they sought to appease the glorious goddess, quaking with fear. But as soon as dawn began to show, they told powerful Calias all things without fail, as the lovely crowned goddess Demeter charged them. So Calias called the countless people to an assembly, and bade them make a goodly temple for rich-haired Demeter, and an altar upon the rising hillock. And they obeyed him right speedily, and hearkened to his voice, doing as he commanded. As for the child, he grew like an immortal being. Now when they had finished building, and had drawn back from their toil, they went every man to his house. But golden-haired Demeter sat there apart from all the blessed gods, and stayed, wasting with yearning for her deep-bosomed daughter. Then she caused a most dreadful and cruel year for mankind over the all-nourishing earth. The ground would not make the seed sprout, for rich-crowned Demeter kept it hid, in the fields the oxen drew many a curved plough in vain, and much white barley was cast upon the land without avail. So she would have destroyed the whole race of man with cruel famine, and have robbed them who dwell on Olympus of their glorious rite of gifts and sacrifices, had not Zeus perceived and marked this in his heart. First he sent golden-winged Iris to call rich-haired Demeter, lovely in form. So he commanded, and she obeyed the dark-clouded son of Cronos, and sped with swift feet across the space between. She came to the stronghold of fragrant Eleusis, and there, finding dark-cloaked Demeter in her temple, spake to her in uttered winged words, Demeter, father Zeus, whose wisdom is everlasting, calls you to come join the tribes of the eternal gods. Come, therefore, and let not the message I bring from Zeus pass unobeyed. Thus said Iris, imploring her, but Demeter's heart was not moved. Then again the father sent forth all the blessed and eternal gods besides, and they came one after the other, and kept calling her and offering many very beautiful gifts, and whatever rights she might be pleased to choose among the deathless gods. Yet no one was able to persuade her mind and will. So wroth was she in her heart but she stubbornly rejected all their words. For she vowed that she would never set foot on fragrant Olympus, nor let fruit spring out of the ground, until she beheld with her eyes her own fair-faced daughter. Now, when all-seeing Zeus the loud thunderer heard this, he sent the slayer of Argus, whose wand is of gold, to Erebus, so that having won over Hades with soft words, he might lead forth chaste Persephone to the light from the misty gloom to join the gods, and that her mother might see her with her eyes and cease from her anger. And Hermes obeyed, and leaving the house of Olympus, straightway sprang down with speed to the hidden places of the earth. And he found the lord Hades in his house seated upon a couch, and his shy mate with him, much reluctant, because she yearned for her mother. But she was afar off, brooding on her fell design because of the deeds of the blessed gods. And the strong slayer of Argus drew near, and said, Dark-haired Hades, ruler over the departed, Father Zeus bids me bring noble Persephone forth from Erebus unto the gods, that her mother may see her with her eyes, and cease from her dread anger with the immortals. For now she plans an awful deed, 
to destroy the weakly tribes of earth-born men, by keeping seed hidden beneath the earth, and so she makes an end of the honours of the undying gods. For she keeps fearful anger, and does not consort with the gods, but sits aloof in her fragrant temple, dwelling in the rocky hold of Eleusis. So he said, and Idonius, ruler over the dead, smiled grimly, and obeyed the behest of Zeus the king. For he straightway urged wise Persephone, saying, Go now, Persephone, to your dark-robed mother, go, and feel kindly in your heart towards me. Be not so exceedingly cast down, for I shall be no unfitting husband for you among the deathless gods, that am own brother to father Zeus. And while you are here, you shall rule all that lives and moves, and shall have the greatest rights among the deathless gods. Those who defraud you, and do not appease your power with offerings, reverently performing rites, and paying fit gifts, shall be punished for evermore. When he said this, wise Persephone was filled with joy, and hastily sprang up for gladness. But he on his part, secretly gave her sweet pomegranate seed to eat, taking care for himself that she might not remain continually with grave, dark-robed Demeter. Then Idonius, the ruler of many, openly got ready his deathless horses beneath the golden chariot, and she mounted on the chariot, and the strong slayer of Argus took reins and whip in his dear hands, and drove forth from the hall, the horses speeding readily. Swiftly they traversed their long course, and neither the sea nor river waters nor grassy glens nor mountain peaks checked the career of the immortal horses, but they clave the deep air above them as they went. And Hermes brought them to the place where rich-crowned Demeter was staying, and checked them before her fragrant temple. And when Demeter saw them, she rushed forth as does a minad down some thick wooded mountain, while Persephone on the other side when she saw her mother's sweet eyes, left the chariot and horses, and leaped down to run to her, and falling upon her neck embraced her. But while Demeter was still holding her dear child in her arms, her heart suddenly misgave her for some snare, so that she feared greatly, and ceased fondling her daughter, and asked of her at once, My child, tell me, surely you have not tasted any food while you were below? Speak out, and hide nothing, but let us both know. For if you have not, you shall come back from loathly Hades and live with me and your father, the dark-clouded son of Kronos, and be honoured by all the deathless gods. But if you have tasted food, you must go back again beneath the secret places of the earth, there to dwell a third part of the seasons every year. Yet for the two parts you shall be with me and the other deathless gods. But when the earth shall bloom with fragrant flowers of spring in every kind, then from the realm of darkness and gloom thou shalt come up once more to be a wonder for gods and mortal men. And now tell me how he wrapped you away to the realm of darkness and gloom, and by what trick did the strong host of many beguile you? Then beautiful Persephone answered her thus, Mother, I will tell you all without error. When luck-bringing Hermes came, swift messenger from my father the son of Cronos and the other sons of heaven, bidding me come back from Erebus that you might see me with your eyes, and so cease from your anger and fearful wrath against the gods, I sprang up at once for joy. But he secretly put in my mouth sweet food, a pomegranate seed, and forced me to taste against my will. Also I will tell you how he wrapped me away by the deep plan of my father, the son of Cronos, and carried me off beneath the depths of the earth, and will relate the whole matter as you ask. All we were playing in a lovely meadow, Leucippe, and Phino, and Electra, and Ianthe, Melita also, and Aiaki with Rodea, and Calerhoe, and Melibosis, and Tyche, and Ocherhoe, fair as a flower, Cresius, Ianira, Acasti, and Admeti, and Rhodope, and Pluto, and charming Calypso. Styx, too, was there, and Urania, and lovely Galaxora, 
with Pallas who rouses battles, and Artemis delighting in arrows. We were playing and gathering sweet flowers in our hands, soft crocuses mingled with irises and hyacinths, and rose blooms and lilies marvellous to see, and the narcissus, which the wide earth caused to grow yellow as a crocus. That I plucked in my joy, but the earth parted beneath, and there the strong lord, the host of many, sprang forth, and in his golden chariot he bore me away, all unwilling, beneath the earth. Then I cried with a shrill cry. All this is true, sore though it grieves me to tell the tale. So did they then, with hearts at one, greatly cheer each the other's soul and spirit, with many an embrace. Their hearts had relief from their griefs, while each took and gave back joyousness. Then bright-coiffed Hecate came near to them, and often did she embrace the daughter of holy Demeter. And from that time the lady Hecate was minister and companion to Persephone. And all-seeing Zeus sent a messenger to them, rich-haired Rhea, to bring dark-cloaked Demeter to join the families of the gods, and he promised to give her what rights she should choose among the deathless gods, and agreed that her daughter should go down for the third part of the circling year to darkness and gloom, but for the two parts should live with her mother and the other deathless gods. Thus he commanded, and the goddess did not disobey the message of Zeus. Swiftly she rushed down from the peaks of Olympus, and came to the plain of Rarus, rich, fertile cornland once, but then in no wise fruitful, for it lay idle and utterly leafless, because the white grain was hidden by design of trim-ankled Demeter. But afterwards, as springtime waxed, it was soon to be waving with long ears of corn, and its rich furrows to be loaded with grain upon the ground, while others would already be bound in sheaves. There first she landed from the fruitless upper air, and glad were the goddesses to see each other, and cheered in heart. Then bright-coiffed Rhea said to Demeter, Come, my daughter, for far-seeing Zeus, the loud thunderer, calls you to join the families of the gods, and has promised to give you what rights you please among the deathless gods, and has agreed that for a third part of the circling year your daughter shall go down to darkness and gloom, but for the two parts shall be with you and the other deathless gods. So has he declared it shall be, and has bowed his head in token. But come, my child, obey, and be not too angry unrelentingly with the dark-clouded son of Kronos, but rather increase forthwith for men the fruit that gives them life. So spake Rhea, and rich-crowned Demeter did not refuse, but straightway made fruit to spring up from the rich lands, so that the whole wide earth was laden with leaves and flowers. Then she went, and to the kings who deal justice, Triptolemus and Diocles the horse-driver, and to doughty Eumolpus and Calius, leader of the people, she showed the conduct of her rites and taught them all her mysteries, to Triptolemus and Polyxenus and Diocles also, awful mysteries, which no one may in any way transgress, or pry into or utter, for deep awe of the gods checks the voice. Happy is he among men upon earth who has seen these mysteries, but he who is uninitiate, and who has no part in them, never has lot of like good things once he is dead, down in the darkness and gloom. But when the bright goddess had taught them all, they went to Olympus to the gathering of the other gods, and there they dwell beside Zeus who delights in thunder, awful and reverend goddesses. Right blessed is he among men on earth whom they freely love, Soon they do send Plutus as guest to his great house, Plutus who gives wealth to mortal men. And now, queen of the land of sweet Eleusis and sea-girt Paros and rocky Antron, lady, giver of good gifts, bringer of seasons, queen Deo, be gracious, you and your daughter, all beauteous Persephone, and for my song grant me heart-cheering substance. And now I will remember you, and another song also. End of section two. Section three of Homeric Hymns, Epigrams, and Battle of Frogs and Mice by Homer. Translated by Hugh G. Evelyn White. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To Dalian Apollo I will remember and not be unmindful of Apollo, who shoots afar. As he goes through the house of Zeus, the gods tremble before him, and all spring up from their seats when he draws near, as he bends his bright bow. But Leto alone stays by the side of Zeus, who delights in thunder, and then she unstrings his bow, and closes his quiver, and takes his archery from his strong shoulders in her hands, and hangs them on a golden peg against a pillar of his father's house. Then she leads him to a seat and makes him sit, and the father gives him nectar in a golden cup, welcoming his dear son, while the other gods make him sit down there, and queenly Leto rejoices, because she bare a mighty son and an archer. Rejoice, blessed Leto, for you bear glorious children, the lord Apollo and Artemis, who delights in arrows, her in Ortigia, and him in rocky Delos as you rested against the great mass of the Cynthian hill, hard by a palm tree, by the streams of Inopus. How, then, shall I sing of you, who in all ways are a worthy theme of song? For everywhere, O Phoebus, the whole range of song is fallen to you, both over the mainland that rears heifers and over the isles, all mountain peaks and high headlands of lofty hills and rivers flowing out to the deep, and beaches sloping seawards, and havens of the sea are your delight. Shall I sing how at the first Leto bear you to be the joy of men, as she rested against Mount Synthus in that rocky isle in sea-girt Delos, while on either hand a dark wave rolled on landwards, driven by shrill winds, whence arising you rule over all mortal men? Among those who are in Crete, and in the township of Athens, and in the isle of Aegina and Euboea, famous for ships, in Aegae and Iresae and Paparathus near the sea, in Thracian Athos and Pelion's towering heights, and Thracian Samos and the shady hills of Ida, in Cyros and Phocaea, and the high hill of Autocane, and fair-lying Imbros and smouldering Lemnos and rich Lesbos, home of Machar, the son of Aeolus and Chios, brightest of all the isles that lie in the sea, and craggy Mimas, and the heights of Coricus, and gleaming Claros, and the sheer hill of Isagia, and watered Samos, and the steep heights of Mycale, in Miletus and Kos, the city of Meropian men, and steep Nidos, and windy Carpathos, in Naxos, and Paros, and rocky Renaea. So far roamed Leto in travail with the god who shoots afar, to see if any land would be willing to make a dwelling for her son. But they greatly trembled and feared, and none, not even the richest of them, dared receive Phoebus, until queenly Leto set foot on Delos, and uttered winged words, and asked her, Delos, if you would be willing to be the abode of my son, Phoebus Apollo, and make him a rich temple, for no other will touch you as you will find, and I think you will never be rich in oxen and sheep, nor bear vintage, nor yet produce plants abundantly. But if you have the temple of far-shooting Apollo, all men will bring you hecatombs and gather here, and incessant savour of rich sacrifice will always arise, and you will feed those who dwell in you from the hand of strangers, for truly your own soil is not rich. So spake Leto, and Delos rejoiced, and answered, and said, Leto, most glorious daughter of great Coeus, joyfully would I receive your child, the far-shooting lord, for it is all too true that I am ill-spoken of among men, whereas thus I should become very greatly honoured. But this saying I fear, and I will not hide it from you, Leto. They say that Apollo will be one that is very haughty, and will greatly lord it among the gods and men all over the fruitful earth. Therefore I greatly fear in heart and spirit that as soon as he sees the light of the sun, he will scorn this island, for truly I have but a hard rocky soil, and overturn me and thrust me down with his feet in the depths of the sea. Then will the great ocean wash deep above my head for ever, and he will go to another land such as will please him, there to make his temple and wooded groves. 
so many footed creatures of the sea will make their lairs in me and black seals their dwellings undisturbed because i lack people yet if you will but dare to swear a great oath goddess that here first he will build a glorious temple to be an oracle for men then let him afterwards make temples and wooded groves amongst all men for surely he will be greatly renowned so said delos and leto swear the great oath of the gods now hear this earth and wide heaven above and dropping water of sticks this is the strongest and most awful oath for the blessed gods surely phoebus shall have here his fragrant altar and precinct and you he shall honour above all now when leto had sworn and ended her oath delos was very glad at the birth of the far-shooting lord but leto was racked nine days and nine nights with pangs beyond want and there were with her all the chiefest of the goddesses dione and rhea and acnea and themis and loud moaning amphitrite and the other deathless goddesses save white-armed hera who sat in the halls of cloud-gathering zeus only ilithia goddess of sore travail had not heard of leto's trouble for she sat on the top of olympus beneath golden clouds by white-armed hera's contriving who kept her close through envy because leto with the lovely tresses was soon to bear a son faultless and strong but the goddess has sent out iris from the well-set isle to bring elithia promising her a great necklace strung with golden threads nine cubits long and they bade iris call her aside from white-armed hera lest she might afterwards turn her from coming with her words when swift iris fleet of foot as the wind had heard all this she set to run and quickly finishing all the distance she came to the home of the gods sheer olympus and forthwith called elithia out from the hall to the door and spoke winged words to her telling her all as the goddesses who dwell on olympus had bidden her so she moved the heart of elithia in her dear breast and they went their way like shy wild doves in their going and as soon as Alithia, the goddess of sore travail, set foot on Delos, the pains of birth seized Leto, and she longed to bring forth. So she cast her arms about a palm tree, and kneeled on the soft meadow, while the earth laughed for joy beneath. Then the child leaped forth to the light, and all the goddesses raised a cry. Straight away, great Phoebus, the goddesses washed you purely and cleanly with sweet water and swathed you in a white garment of fine texture new woven and fastened a golden band about you now leto did not give apollo bearer of the golden blade her breast but themis duly poured nectar and ambrosia with her divine hands and leto was glad because she had borne a strong son and an archer but as soon as you had tasted that divine heavenly food o phoebus you could no longer then be held by golden cords nor confined with bands but all their ends were undone forthwith phoebus apollo spoke out among the deathless goddesses the lyre and the curved bow shall ever be dear to me and i will declare to men the unfailing will of zeus so said phoebus the long-haired god who shoots afar and began to walk upon the wide-pathed earth, and all the goddesses were amazed at him. Then with gold all Delos was laden, beholding the child of Zeus and Leto for joy, because the god chose her above the islands and shore to make his dwelling in her, and she loved him yet more in her heart, blossomed as does a mountain-top with woodland flowers and you o lord apollo god of the silver bow shooting afar now walked on craggy synthus and now kept wandering about the islands and the people in them many are your temples and wooded groves and all peaks and towering bluffs of lofty mountains and rivers flowing to the sea are dear to you phoebus yet in delos do you most delight your heart for there the long-robed ionians gather in your honour with their children and shy wives with boxing and dancing and song mindful they delight you so often as they hold their gathering a man would say that they were deathless and unaging if he should then come upon the ionians so met together for he would see the graces of them all 
and would be pleased in heart gazing at the men and well-girded women, with their swift ships and great wealth. And there is the great wonder besides, and its renown shall never perish, the girls of Delos, handmaidens of the far-shooter, for when they have praised Apollo first, and also Leto and Artemis, who delights in arrows, they sing a strain telling of men and women of past days, and charm the tribes of men. Also they can imitate the tongues of all men, and their clattering speech. Each would say that he himself were singing, so close to truth is their sweet song. And now may Apollo be favourable and Artemis, and farewell all you maidens. Remember me in after time, whenever any one of men on earth, a stranger who has seen and suffered much, comes here and asks you, Whom ye think, girls, is the sweetest singer that comes here, and in whom do you most delight? Then answer each and all with one voice, He is a blind man, and dwells in rocky Chios. His lays are evermore supreme. As for me, I will carry your renown as far as I roam over the earth, to the well-placed cities of man, and they will believe also, for indeed this thing is true. And I will never cease to praise far-shooting Apollo, god of the silver bow, whom rich-haired Leto bear. To Pythian Apollo O Lord, Lycia is yours, and lovely Maeonia, and Miletus, charming city by the sea. But over wave-girt Delos you greatly reign your own self. Leto's all-glorious son goes to rocky Pytho, playing upon his hollow lyre, clad in divine perfumed garments, and his lyre, at the touch of the golden key, sings sweet. Thence, swift as thought, he speeds from earth to Olympus, to the house of Zeus, to join the gathering of the other gods. Then straight away the undying gods think only of the lyre and song, and all the muses together, voice sweetly answering voice. Him the unending gifts the gods enjoy, and the sufferings of men, and all that they endure at the hands of the deathless gods, and how they live witless and helpless, and cannot find healing for death or defence against old age. Meanwhile, the rich tressed graces and cheerful seasons dance with Harmonia and Hebe and Aphrodite, daughter of Zeus, holding each other by the wrist, and among them sings one, not mean or puny, but tall to look upon and enviable and mean, Artemis, who delights in arrows, sister of Apollo. Among them sport Ares and the keen-eyed slayer of Argus, while Apollo plays his lyre, stepping high and featly, and a radiance shines around him, the gleaming of his feet in close-woven vest. And they, even gold-tressed Leto and wise Zeus, rejoice in their great hearts as they watch their dear son playing among the undying gods. How then shall I sing of you, though in all ways you are a worthy theme for song? Shall I sing of you as wooer and in the fields of love? How you went wooing the daughter of Azan, along with godlike Iscus, the son of well-horsed Elatius, or with Forbus sprung from Triops, or with Eurythius, or with Leucippus, and the wife of Leucippus, you on foot, he with his chariot, yet he fell not short of Triops? Or shall I sing how at the first you went about the earth seeking a place of oracle for men, O far-shooting Apollo? To Pieria first you went down from Olympus, and passed by sandy Lectus and Enienae, and through the land of the Peribi. Soon you came to Iolcus, and set foot in Caneum, in Euboea, famed for ships. You stood in the Lelantine plain, but it pleased not your heart to make a temple there and wooded groves. From there you crossed the Euripus far-shooting Apollo, and went up the green holy hills, going on to Mycalessus and grassy-bedded Tumessus, and so came to the wood-clad abode of Thebe, for as yet no man lived in holy Thebe, nor were there tracks nor ways about Thebe's wheat-bearing plain as yet. And further still you went, O far-shooting Apollo, and came to Onchestus, Poseidon's bright grove. There the new-broken colt distressed with drawing the trim chariot gets spirit again, and the skilled driver springs from his car and goes on his way. 
Then the horses for a while rattle the empty car, being rid of guidance. And if they break the chariot in the woody grove, men look after the horses, but tilt the chariot and leave it there. For this was the right from the very first. And the drivers pray to the lord of the shrine, but the chariot falls to the lot of the god. Further yet you went, O far-shooting Apollo, and reached next Cephisus's sweet stream, which pours forth its sweet-flowing water from Lilia, and crossing over it, O worker from afar, you passed many-towered Ocalia, and reached grassy Haliartus. Then you went towards Telphusa, and there the pleasant place seemed fit for making a temple and wooded grove. You came very near and spoke to her, Telphusa, here I am minded to make a glorious temple, an oracle for men, and hither they will always bring perfect hecatombs, both those who live in rich Peloponnesus and those of Europe and all the wave-washed isles, coming to seek oracles. And I will deliver to them all counsel that cannot fail, giving answer in my rich temple. So said Phoebus Apollo, and laid out all the foundations throughout, wide and very long. But when Telphusa saw this, she was angry in heart, and spoke, saying, Lord Phoebus, worker from afar, I will speak a word of counsel to your heart, since you are minded to make here a glorious temple to be an oracle for men who will always bring hither perfect hecatombs for you. Yet I will speak out, and do you lay up my words in your heart. The trampling of swift horses and the sound of mules watering at my sacred springs will always irk you, and men will like better to gaze at the well-made chariots and stamping swift-footed horses than at your great temple and the many treasures that are within. But if you will be moved by me, for you, Lord, are stronger and mightier than I, and your strength is very great, build at Crissa, below the glades of Parnassus. There no bright chariot will clash, and there will be no noise of swift-footed horses near your well-built altar. But so the glorious tribes of men will bring gifts to you as Ipaeon, hail healer, and you will receive with delight rich sacrifices from the people dwelling round about. So said Telphusa that she alone, and not the far shooter, should have renown there, and she persuaded the far shooter. Further yet you went, far shooting Apollo, until you came to the town of the presumptuous Phlegii who dwell on this earth in a lovely glade near the Cephisian lake, caring not for Zeus. And thence you went speeding swiftly to the mountain ridge, and came to Crissa beneath snowy Parnassus. A foothill turns towards the west, a cliff hangs over it from above, and a hollow rugged glade runs under. There the Lord Phoebus Apollo resolved to make his lovely temple, and thus he said, in this place I am minded to build a glorious temple to be an oracle for men, and here they will always bring perfect hecatombs, both they who dwell in rich Peloponnesus and the men of Europe, and from all the wave-washed isles coming to question me. And I will deliver to them all counsel that cannot fail, answering them in my rich temple. When he had said this, Phoebus Apollo laid out all the foundations throughout, wide and very long. And upon these, the sons of Arginus, Trophonius, and Agamedes, dear to the deathless gods, laid a footing of stone. And the countless tribes of men built the whole temple of wrought stones, to be sung of forever. But nearby was a sweet flowing spring, and there, with his strong bow, the Lord, the son of Zeus, killed the bloated great she-dragon, a fierce monster, want to do great mischief to men upon earth, to men themselves and to their thin-shanked sheep, for she was a very bloody plague. She it was who once received from gold-throned Hera and brought up fell, cruel Typhaon to be a plague to men. Once on a time Hera bare him because she was angry with Father Zeus, when the son of Cronos bare all glorious Athena in his head. Thereupon, queenly Hera was angry and spoke thus among the assembled gods. Hear from me, all gods and goddesses, how cloud-gathering Zeus begins to dishonor me wantonly. He has made me his true-hearted wife. See now, apart from me he has given birth to bright-eyed Athena, who is foremost among all the blessed gods. 
but my son Hephaestus, whom I bear, was weakly among all the blessed gods, and shrivelled of foot, a shame and a disgrace to me in heaven, whom I myself took in my hands and cast out, so that he fell in the great sea. But silver-shod Thetis, the daughter of Nereus, took and cared for him with her sisters, would that she had done other service to the blessed gods. O oh, wicked one and crafty, what else will you now devise? How dared you by yourself give birth to bright-eyed Athena? Would not I have borne you a child, I who was at least called your wife among the undying gods who hold wide heaven? Beware now, lest I devise some evil thing for you hereafter. Yes, now I will contrive that a son be born me, to be foremost among the undying gods, and that without casting shame on the holy bond of wedlock between you and me. And I will not come to your bed, but will consort with the blessed gods far off from you. When she had so spoken, she went apart from the gods, being very angry. Then, straight away, large-eyed queenly Hera prayed, striking the ground flatwise with her hand, and speaking thus. Hear now, I pray, earth and wide heaven above, and you titan gods who dwell beneath the earth about great Tartarus, and from whom are sprung both gods and men, hearken you now to me, one and all, and grant that I may bear a child apart from Zeus, no whit lesser than him in strength. Nay, let him be as much stronger than Zeus, as all-seeing Zeus than Cronos. Thus she cried, and lashed the earth with her strong hand. Then the life-giving earth was moved, and when Hera saw it, she was glad in heart, for she thought her prayer would be fulfilled. And thereafter she never came to the bed of wise Zeus for a full year, not to sit in her carved chair as aforetime to plan wise counsel for him, but stayed in her temples, where many pray, and delighted in her offerings, large-eyed queenly Hera. But when the months and days were fulfilled, and the seasons duly came on as the earth moved round, she bare one neither like the gods nor mortal men, fell cruel Typhaeon, to be a plague to men. Straightway large-eyed queenly Hera took him, and bringing one evil thing to another such, gave him to the dragoness, and she received him. And this Typhaeon used to work great mischief among the famous tribes of men. Whosoever met the dragoness, the day of doom would sweep him away, until the Lord Apollo, who deals death from afar, shot a strong arrow at her. Then she, rent with bitter pangs, lay drawing great gasps for breath and rolling about that place. An awful noise swelled up, unspeakable, as she writhed continually this way and that amid the wood. And so she left her life, breathing it forth in blood. Then Phoebus Apollo boasted over her, Now wrought here upon the soil that feeds man, you at least shall live no more to be a fell bane to men, who eat the fruit of the all-nourishing earth, and who will bring hither perfect hecatombs. Against cruel death neither Typhoeus shall avail you, nor ill-famed Chimera, but here shall the earth and shining Hyperion make you rot. Thus said Phoebus, exulting over her, and darkness covered her eyes, and the holy strength of Helios made her rot away there, wherefore the place is now called Pytho, and men call the Lord Apollo by another name, Pythian, because on that spot the power of piercing Helios made the monster rot away. Then Phoebus Apollo saw that the sweet-flowing spring had beguiled him, and he started out in anger against Telphusa, and soon coming to her, he stood close by and spoke to her. Telphusa, you were not, after all, to keep to yourself this lovely place by deceiving my mind, and pour forth your clear flowing water. Here my renown shall also be, and not yours alone. Thus spoke the Lord, far-working Apollo, and pushed over upon her a crag with a shower of rocks, hiding her streams and he made himself an altar in a wooded grove, very near the clear-flowing stream. In that place all men pray to the Great One by the name Telphusian, because he humbled the stream of holy Telphusa. Then Phoebus Apollo pondered in his heart 
what men he should bring in to be his ministers in sacrifice and to serve him in rocky Pytho. And while he considered this, he became aware of a swift ship upon the wine-like sea, in which were many men and goodly, Cretans from Canossus, the city of Minos, they who do sacrifice to the prince and announce his decrees. Whatsoever Phoebus Apollo, bearer of the golden blade, speaks in answer from his laurel tree below the dells of Parnassus. These men were sailing in their black ship for traffic and for profit to sandy Pylos and to the men of Pylos. But Phoebus Apollo met them. In the open sea he sprang upon their swift ship like a dolphin in shape, and lay there a great and awesome monster, and none of them gave heed so as to understand. But they sought to cast the dolphin overboard. But he kept shaking the black ship every way and making the timbers quiver. So they sat silent in their craft for fear, and did not loose the sheets throughout the black hollow ship, nor lowered the sail of their dark prowed vessel. But as they had set it first of all with oxhide ropes, so they kept sailing on, for a rushing south wind hurried on the swift ship from behind. First they passed by Malia, and then along the Laconian coast they came to Tenerum, sea-garlanded town and country of Helios, who gladdens men, where the thick-fleeced sheep of the Lord Helios feed continually and occupy a gladsome country. There they wished to put their ship to shore and land, and comprehend the great marvel, and see with their eyes whether the monster would remain upon the deck of the hollow ship, or spring back into the briny deep where fishes shoal. But the well-built ship would not obey the helm, but went on its way all along Peloponnesus, and the lord, far-working Apollo, guided it easily with the breath of the breeze. So the ship ran on its course and came to Arena and lovely Argyphia, and Thryon, the ford of Alpheus, and well-placed Ipe, and sandy Pylos and the men of Pylos. Past Cruni it went, and Calchas, and past Dime and fair Elis, where the Epi rule. And at the time when she was making for Ferai, exulting in the breeze from Zeus, there appeared to them below the clouds the steep mountain of Ithaca, and Dolichium, and Same, and wooded Zacynthus. But when they were passed by all the coast of Peloponnesus, then, towards Chrysa, that vast gulf began to heave in sight, which through all its length cuts off the rich isle of Pelops. There came on them a strong, clear west wind by ordinance of Zeus, and blew from heaven vehemently, that with all speed the ship might finish coursing over the briny water of the sea. So they began again to voyage back towards the dawn and the sun, and Lord Apollo, son of Zeus, led them on until they reached far-seen Chrysa, land of vines, and into haven. There the sea-coursing ship grounded on the sands. Then, like a star at noonday, the Lord, far-working Apollo, leaped from the ship, Flashes of fire flew from him thick, and their brightness reached to heaven. He entered into his shrine between priceless tripods, and there made a flame to flare up bright, showing forth the splendor of his shafts, so that their radiance filled all Chrysa, and the wives and well-girded daughters of the Chrysians raised a cry at that outburst of Phoebus, for he cast great fear upon them all. From his shrine he sprang forth again, swift as a thought, to speed again to the ship, bearing the form of a man, brisk and sturdy, in the prime of his youth, while his broad shoulders were covered with his hair. And he spoke to the Cretans, uttering winged words, Strangers, who are you? Whence come you sailing along the paths of the sea? Are you for traffic, or do you wander at random over the sea as pirates do, who put their own lives to hazard, and bring mischief to men of foreign parts as they roam? Why rest you so, and are afraid, and do not go ashore nor stow the gear of your black ship? For that is the custom of men who live by bread, whenever they come to land in their dark ships from the main, spent with toil. At once desire for sweet food catches them about the heart. So speaking, he put courage in their hearts, and the master of the Cretans answered him, and said, Stranger, though you are nothing like mortal men in shape or stature, but are as the deathless gods, hail and all happiness to you, and may the gods give you good. 
Now tell me truly, that I may surely know it. What country is this? And what land and what men live herein? As for us, with thoughts set otherwards, we were sailing over the great sea to Pylos from Crete, for from there we declare that we are sprung. But now are come on shipboard to this place by no means willingly, another way and other paths, and gladly would we return. But one of the deathless gods brought us here against our will. Then far-working Apollo answered them and said, Strangers who once dwelt about wooded Knossos, but now shall return no more, each to his loved city and fair house and dear wife. Here shall you keep my rich temple that is honoured by many men. I am the son of Zeus, Apollo is my name. But you I brought here over the wide gulf of the sea, meaning you no hurt. Nay, here you shall keep my rich temple that is greatly honoured among men, and you shall know the plans of the deathless gods, and by their will you shall be honoured continually for all time. And now come, make haste, and do as I say. First, loose the sheets and lower the sail, and then draw the swift ship up upon the land. Take out your goods and the gear of the straight ship, and make an altar upon the beach of the sea. Light fire upon it, and make an offering of white meal. Next, stand side by side around the altar, and pray. And inasmuch as at the first on the hazy sea I sprang upon the swift ship in the form of a dolphin, Pray to me as Apollo Delphinius. Also the altar itself shall be called Delphinius, and overlooking forever. Afterwards, sup beside your dark ship, and pour an offering to the blessed gods who dwell on Olympus. But when you have put away craving for sweet food, come with me singing the hymn Iapean, Hail Healer, until you come to the place where you shall keep my rich temple. So said Apollo, and they readily hearkened to him and obeyed him. First they unfastened the sheets and let down the sail and lowered the mast by the four stays upon the mast rest. Then, landing upon the beach of the sea, they hauled up the ship from the water to dry land and fixed long stays under it. Also they made an altar upon the beach of the sea, and when they had lit a fire, made an offering of white meal and prayed standing around the altar as Apollo had bidden them. Then they took their meal by the swift black ship, and poured an offering to the blessed gods who dwell on Olympus. And when they had put away craving for drink and food, they started out with the Lord Apollo, the son of Zeus, to lead them, holding a lyre in his hands, and playing sweetly as he stepped high and featly. So the Cretans followed him to Pytho, marching in time as they chanted the Ia Paean, after the manner of the Cretan Paean singers, and of those in whose hearts the heavenly muse has put sweet-voiced song. With tireless feet they approached the ridge, and straightway came to Parnassus, and the lovely place where they were to dwell, honoured by many men. There Apollo brought them and showed them his most holy sanctuary and rich temple. But their spirit was stirred in their dear breasts, and the master of the Cretans asked him, saying, Lord, since you have brought us here far from our dear ones and our fatherland, for so it seemed good to your heart. Tell us now how we shall live. That we would know of you. This land is not to be desired either for vineyards or for pastures, so that we can live well thereon and also minister to men. Then Apollo, the son of Zeus, smiled upon them and said, Foolish mortals and poor drudges are you that you seek cares and hard toils and straits. Easily will I tell you a word and set it in your hearts. Though each one of you with a knife in hand should slaughter sheep continually, yet would you always have abundant store, even all that the glorious tribes of men bring here for me. But guard you my temple, and receive the tribes of men that gather to this place, and especially show mortal men my will, and do you keep righteousness in your heart. But if any shall be disobedient, and pay no heed to my warning, or if there shall be any idle word or deed and outrage as is common among mortal men, then other men shall be your masters, and with a strong hand shall make you subject for ever. All has been told to you. Do you keep it in your heart? And so, farewell, son of Zeus and Leto. But I will remember you, and another hymn also. End of section 3
Section 4 of Homeric Hymns, Epigrams, and Battle of Frogs and Mice by Homer. Translated by Hugh G. Evelyn White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To Hermes Muse, sing of Hermes, the son of Zeus and Maia, lord of Cyllene and Arcadia, rich in flocks, the luck-bringing messenger of the immortals, whom Maia bare, the rich tressed nymph, when she was joined in love with Zeus, a shy goddess, for she avoided the company of the blessed gods, and lived within a deep, shady cave. There the son of Cronos used to lie with the rich tressed nymph, unseen by deathless gods and mortal men, at dead of night, while sweet sleep should hold white-armed Hera fast. And when the purpose of great Zeus was fulfilled, and the tenth moon with her was fixed in heaven, she was delivered, and a notable thing was come to pass. For then she bare a son of many shifts, blandly cunning, a robber, a cattle-driver, a bringer of dreams, a watcher by night, a thief at the gates, one who was soon to show forth wonderful deeds among the deathless gods. Born with the dawning, at midday he played in the lyre, and in the evening he stole the cattle of fair-shooting Apollo on the fourth day of the month. For on that day, queenly Maia bare him. So soon as he had leaped from his mother's heavenly womb, he lay not long waiting in his holy cradle, but he sprang up and sought the oxen of Apollo. But as he stepped over the threshold of the high-roofed cave, he found a tortoise there and gained endless delight. For it was Hermes who first made the tortoise a singer. The creature fell in his way at the courtyard gate, where it was feeding on the rich grass before the dwelling, waddling along. When he saw it, the luck-bringing son of Zeus laughed, and said, An omen of great luck for me so soon! I do not slight it. Hail, comrade of the feast, lovely in shape, sounding at the dance! With joy I meet you! Where got you that rich god for covering, that spangled shell, a tortoise living in the mountains? But I will take and carry you within, you shall help me, and I will do you no disgrace, though first of all you must profit me. It is better to be at home. Harm may come out of doors. Living, you shall be a spell against mischievous witchcraft. But if you die, then you shall make sweetest song. Thus speaking, he took up the tortoise in both hands, and went back into the house carrying his charming toy. Then he cut off its limbs, and scooped out the marrow of the mountain tortoise with a scoop of grey iron. As a swift thought darts through the heart of a man when thronging cares haunt him, or as bright glances flash from the eye, so glorious Hermes planned both thought and deed at once. He cut stalks of reed to measure, and fixed them, fastening their ends across the back and through the shell of the tortoise, and then stretched oxhide all over it by his skill. Also he put in the horns, and fitted a cross-piece upon the two of them, and stretched seven strings of sheep-gut. But when he had made it, he proved each string in turn with the key, as he held the lovely thing. At the touch of his hand it sounded marvellously, and as he tried it, the god sang sweet random snatches, even as youths bandy taunts at festivals. He sang of Zeus, the son of Cronos, and neat-shod Maia, the converse which they had before in the comradeship of love, telling all the glorious tale of his own begetting. He celebrated, too, the handmaids of the nymph and her bright home, and the tripods all about the house, and the abundant cauldrons. But while he was singing of all these, his heart was bent on other matters, and he took the hollow lyre and laid it in his sacred cradle, and sprang from the sweet-smelling hall to a watch-place, pondering sheer trickery in his heart, deeds such as knavish folk pursue in the dark night-time, for he longed to taste flesh. The sun was going down beneath the earth towards ocean with his horses and chariot, when Hermes came hurrying to the shadowing mountains of Pieria, where the divine cattle of the blessed gods had their steads, and grazed the pleasant, unmown meadows. Of these, the son of Maia, the sharp-eyed slayer of Argus, then cut off from the herd fifty loud-lowing kine, and drove them straggling-wise across a sandy place, turning their hoof-prints aside. Also he bethought him of a crafty ruse, and reversed the marks of their hooves, making the front behind and the hind before. 
while he himself walked the other way. Then he wove sandals with wicker work by the sand of the sea, wonderful things, unthought of, unimagined, for he mixed together tamarisk and myrtle twigs, fastening together an armful of their fresh young wood, and tied them, leaves and all, securely under his feet as light sandals. That brushwood the glorious slayer of Argus plucked in Pieria as he was preparing for his journey, making shift as one making haste for a long journey. But an old man, tilling his flowering vineyard, saw him as he was hurrying down the plain through grassy Onchestus. So the son of Maia began and said to him, Old man, digging about your vines with bowed shoulders, surely you shall have much wine when all these bear fruit. If you obey me and strictly remember not to have seen what you have seen, and not to have heard what you have heard, and to keep silent when nothing of your own is harmed. When he had said this much, he hurried the strong cattle on together, through many shadowy mountains and echoing gorges and flowering plains glorious. Hermes drove them, and now the divine night, his dark ally, was mostly past, and dawn that sets folk to work was quickly coming on, while bright Selene, daughter of the Lord Pallas, Megamedes' son, had just climbed her watch-post, when the strong son of Zeus drove the wide-browed cattle of Phoebus Apollo to the river Alpheus, and they came unwearied to the high-roofed byres and the drinking troughs that were before the noble meadow. Then, after he had well fed the loud bellowing cattle with fodder and driven them into the byre, close-packed and chewing lotus and dewy galangal, he gathered a pile of wood and began to seek the art of fire. He chose a stout laurel branch and trimmed it with the knife, held firmly in his hand, and the hot smoke rose up, for it was Hermes who first invented fire sticks and fire. Next he took many dried sticks and piled them thick and plenty in a sunken trench, and flame began to glow, spreading afar the blast of fierce burning fire. And while the strength of glorious Hephaestus was beginning to kindle the fire, he dragged out two lowing horned cows close to the fire, for great strength was with him. He threw them both panting upon their backs on the ground, and rolled them on their sides, bending their necks over, and pierced their vital cord. Then he went on from task to task. First he cut up the rich fatted meat, and pierced it with wooden spits, and roasted flesh and the honourable chine and the paunch full of dark blood all together. He laid them there upon the ground, and spread out the hides on a rugged rock. And so they are still there many ages afterwards, a long, long time after all this, and are continually. Next, glad-hearted Hermes dragged the rich meats he had prepared, and put them on a smooth flat stone, and divided them into twelve portions, distributed by lot, making each portion wholly honourable. Then glorious Hermes longed for the sacrificial meat, for the sweet savour wearied him, god though he was. Nevertheless, his proud heart was not prevailed upon to devour the flesh, although he greatly desired. But he put away in the high-roofed byre the fat and all the flesh, placing them high up to be a token of his youthful theft. And after that he gathered dry sticks and utterly destroyed with fire all the hooves and all the heads. And when the god had duly finished all, he threw his sandals into deep eddying Alpheus, and quenched the embers covering the black ashes with sand, and so spent the night while Selene's soft light shone down. Then the god went straight back again at dawn to the bright crests of Selene, and no one met him on the long journey either of the blessed gods or mortal men, nor did any dog bark. And luck bringing Hermes, the son of Zeus, passed edgeways through the keyhole of the hall like the autumn breeze, even as mist. Straight through the cave he went, and came to the rich inner chamber, walking softly and making no noise as one might upon the floor. Then glorious Hermes went hurriedly to his cradle, wrapping his swaddling clothes about his shoulders as though he were a feeble babe, and lay playing with the covering about his knees. But at his left hand he kept close his sweet lyre. But the god did not pass unseen by the goddess his mother, but she said to him, How now, you rogue! Whence come you back so at night-time, you that wear shamelessness as a garment, 
and now I surely believe the son of Leto will soon have you forth out of doors with unbreakable cords about your ribs, or you will live a rogue's life in the glens robbing by wiles. Go to, then. Your father got you to be a great worry to mortal men and deathless gods. Then Hermes answered her with crafty words. Mother! Why do you seek to frighten me like a feeble child whose heart knows few words of blame, a fearful babe that fears its mother scolding? Nay, but I will try whatever plan is best, and so feed myself and you continually. We will not be content to remain here as you bid, alone of all the gods, unfeed with offerings and prayers. Better to live in fellowship with the deathless gods continually, rich, wealthy, and enjoying stores of grain, than to sit always in a gloomy cave. And as regards honour, I too will enter upon the right that Apollo has. If my father will not give it me, I will seek, and I am able, to be a prince of robbers. And if Leto's most glorious son shall seek me out, I think another and a greater loss will befall him. For I will go to Pytho to break into his great house, and will plunder therefrom splendid tripods and cauldrons and gold, and plenty of bright iron and much apparel, and you shall see it if you will. With such words they spoke together, the son of Zeus who holds the ages, and the lady Maia. Now Eos, the early born, bringing light to men, was rising from deep flowing ocean, when Apollo, as he went, came to Onchestus, the lovely grove and sacred place of the loud roaring holder of the earth. There he found an old man grazing his beast along the pathway from the courtyard fence. And the all-glorious son of Leto began, and said to him, Old man, weeder of grassy Onchestus, I am come here from Pieria, seeking cattle, cows all of them, all with curving horns from my herd. The black bull was grazing alone away from the rest, but fierce-eyed hounds followed the cows, four of them, all of one mind, like men. These were left behind, the dogs and the bull, which is a great marvel. But the cows strayed out of the soft meadow, away from the pasture, when the sun was just going down. Now tell me this, old man, born long ago, have you seen one passing along behind those cows? Then the old man answered him, and said, My son, it is hard to tell all that one's eyes see. For many wayfarers pass to and fro this way, some bent on much evil, and some on good. It is difficult to know each one. However, I was digging about my plot of vineyard all day long until the sun went down, and I thought, good sir, but I do not know for certain, that I marked a child, whoever the child was, that followed long-horned cattle, an infant who had a staff and kept walking from side to side, he was driving them backwards way, with their heads towards him. So said the old man, and when Apollo heard this report, he went yet more quickly on his way, and presently, seeing a long-winged bird, he knew at once by that omen that the thief was the child of Zeus, the son of Cronos. So the lord Apollo, son of Zeus, hurried on to goodly Pylos, seeking his shambling oxen, and he had his broad shoulders covered with a dark cloud. But when the far shooter perceived the tracks, he cried, O ho! Truly this is a great marvel that my eyes behold. These are indeed the tracks of straight-horned oxen, but they are turned backwards towards the flowery meadow. But these others are not the footprints of man or woman or grey wolves or bears or lions, nor do I think they are the tracks of a rough-maned centaur, whoever it be that with swift feet makes such monstrous footprints. Wonderful are the tracks on this side of the way, but yet more wonderful are those on that. When he had so said, the Lord Apollo, the son of Zeus, hastened on and came to the forest-clad mountain of Silene, and the deep-shadowed cave in the rock where the divine nymph brought forth the child of Zeus, who is the son of Cronos. A sweet odor spread over the lovely hill, and many thin-shanked sheep were grazing on the grass. Then, far-shooting Apollo himself, stepped down in haste over the stone threshold into the dusky cave. Now when the son of Zeus and Maia saw Apollo in a rage about his cattle, he snuggled down in his fragrant swaddling clothes, and as wood ash covers over the deep embers of tree stumps, so Hermes cuddled himself up when he saw the far-shooter. 
he squeezed head and hands and feet together in a small space, like a newborn child seeking sweet sleep. Though in truth he was wide awake, and he kept his lyre under his armpit. But the son of Leto was aware and failed not to perceive the beautiful mountain nymph and her dear son, albeit a little child and swathed so craftily. He peered in every corner of the great dwelling, and taking a bright key, he opened three closets full of nectar and lovely ambrosia, and much gold and silver was stored in them, and many garments of the nymph, some purple and some silvery white, such as are kept in the sacred houses of the blessed gods. Then, after the son of Leto had searched out the recesses of the great house, he spake to glorious Hermes, Child, lying there in the cradle, make haste and tell me of my cattle, or we two will soon fall out angrily for I will take and cast you into dusky Tartarus and awful hopeless darkness, and neither your mother nor your father shall free you or bring you up again to the light, but you will wander under the earth and be the leader amongst little folk. Then Hermes answered him with crafty words, Son of Leto, what harsh words are these you have spoken, and is it cattle of the field you are come here to seek? I have not seen them. I have not heard of them. No one has told me of them. I cannot give news of them, nor win the reward for news. Am I like a cattle lifter, a stalwart person? This is no task for me. Rather, I care for other things. I care for sleep and milk of my mother's breast and wrappings round my shoulders and warm baths. Let no one hear the cause of this dispute. For this will be a great marvel indeed among the deathless gods, that a child newly born should pass in through the forepart of the house with cattle of the field. Herein you speak extravagantly. I was born yesterday, and my feet are soft, and the ground beneath is rough. Nevertheless, if you will have it so, I will swear a great oath by my father's head, and vow that neither am I guilty myself, neither have I seen any other who stole your cows, whatever cows may be, for I know them only by hearsay. So then Hermes, shooting quick glances from his eyes, and he kept raising his brows and looking this way and that, whistling along and listening to Apollo's story as to an idle tale. But far-working Apollo laughed softly and said to him, O oh, rogue, deceiver, crafty in heart, you talk so innocently that I most surely believe that you have broken into many a well-built house and stripped more than one poor wretch bare this night, gathering his goods together all over the house without noise. You will plague many a lonely herdsman in mountain glades, when you come on herds and thick-fleeced sheep, and have a hankering after flesh. But come now, if you would not sleep your last and latest sleep, get out of your cradle, you comrade of dark night." Surely hereafter this shall be your title amongst the deathless gods, to be called the Prince of Robbers continually. So said Phoebus Apollo, and took the child and began to carry him. But at that moment the strong slayer of Argus had his plan, and while Apollo held him in his hands, sent forth an omen, a hard-worked belly surf, a rude messenger, and sneezed directly after. And when Apollo heard it, he dropped glorious Hermes out of his hands on the ground. Then, sitting down before him, though he was eager to go on his way, he spoke mockingly to Hermes. Fear not, little swaddling baby, son of Zeus and Maia. I shall find the strong cattle presently by these omens, and you shall lead the way. When Apollo had so said, Cyllenian Hermes sprang up quickly, starting in haste. With both hands he pushed up to his ears the covering that he had wrapped about his shoulders, and said, Where are you carrying me, far worker, hastiest of all the gods? Is it because of your cattle that you are so angry and harass me? Oh dear, would that all the sort of oxen might perish, for it is not I who stole your cows, nor did I see another steal them, whatever cows may be, and of that I have only heard report. Nay, Give right, and take it before Zeus, the son of Kronos. So Hermes the shepherd, and Leto's glorious son, kept stubbornly disputing each article of their quarrel, Apollo speaking truly, 
not unfairly sought to seize glorious Hermes because of the cows. But he, the Cyllenian, tried to deceive the god of the silver bow with tricks and cunning words. But when, though he had many wiles, he found the other had as many shifts, he began to walk across the sand, himself in front, while the son of Zeus and Leto came behind. Soon they came, these lovely children of Zeus, to the top of fragrant Olympus, to their father, the son of Cronos, for there were the scales of judgment set for them both. There was an assembly on snowy Olympus, and the immortals who perished not were gathering after the hour of gold-throned dawn. Then Hermes and Apollo of the silver bow stood at the knees of Zeus, and Zeus, who thunders on high, spoke to his glorious son, and asked him, Phoebus, whence come you driving this great spoil, a child newborn that has the look of a herald? This is a weighty matter that is come before the council of the gods. Then the lord, far-working Apollo, answered him, O my father, you shall soon hear no trifling tale, though you reproach me, that I alone am fond of spoil. Here is a child, a burgling robber, whom I found after a long journey in the hills of Cyllene. For my part, I have never seen one so pert, either among the gods or all men, that catch folk unawares throughout the world. He stole away my cows from their meadow, and drove them off in the evening along the shore of the loud roaring sea, making straight for Pylos. There were double tracks, and wonderful they were, such as one might marvel at, the doing of a clever sprite. For as for the cows, the dark dust kept and showed their footprints leading towards the flowery meadow. But he himself, bewildering creature, crossed the sandy ground outside the path, not on his feet nor yet on his hands, but furnished with some other means he trudged his way, wonder of wonders, as though one walked on slender oak trees. Now while he followed the cattle across sandy ground, all the tracks showed quite clearly in the dust, but when he had finished the long way across the sand, presently the cow's track and his could not be traced over the hard ground, but a mortal man noticed him as he drove the wide-browed kind straight towards Pylos. And as soon as he had shut them up quietly, and had gone home by crafty turns and twists, he lay down in his cradle in the gloom of a dim cave, as still as dark night, so that not even an eagle keenly gazing would have spied him. Much he rubbed his eyes with his hands as he prepared falsehood, and himself straightway said roundly, I have not seen them, I have not heard of them, no man has told me of them, I could not tell you of them, nor win the reward of telling. When he had so spoken, Phoebus Apollo sat down, but Hermes on his part answered and said, pointing at the son of Cronos, the lord of all the gods, Zeus, my father, indeed I will speak truth to you, for I am truthful and cannot tell a lie. He came to our house today looking for his shambling cows as the sun was newly rising. He brought no witnesses with him, nor any of the blessed gods who had seen the theft, but with great violence ordered me to confess, threatening much to throw me into wide Tartarus, for he has the rich bloom of glorious youth, while I was born but yesterday, as he too knows, nor am I like a cattle lifter, a sturdy fellow. Believe my tale, for you claim to be my own father, that I did not drive his cows to my house, so may I prosper, nor cross the threshold, this I say truly. I reverence Helios greatly, and the other gods, and you I love, and him I dread. You yourself know that I am not guilty, and I will swear a great oath upon it, no, by these rich-decked porticos of the gods. And some day I will punish him, strong as he is, for this pitiless inquisition. But now do you help the younger. So spake the Selenian the slayer of Argus, while he kept shooting sidelong glances, and kept his swaddling clothes upon his arm, and did not cast them away. But Zeus laughed out loud to see his evil plotting child well and cunningly denying guilt about the cattle. And he bade them both to be of one mind, and search for the cattle, and guiding Hermes to lead the way, and, without mischievousness of heart, to show the place where now he had hidden the strong cattle. Then the son of Cronos bowed his head, and goodly Hermes obeyed him, for the will of Zeus, who holds the Aegis, easily prevailed with him. 
Then the two all glorious children of Zeus hastened both to sandy Pylos and reached the ford of Alpheus, and came to the fields and the high roofed byre where the beasts were cherished at night time. Now while Hermes went to the cave in the rock and began to drive out the strong cattle, the son of Leto, looking aside, saw the cowhides on the sheer rock, and he asked glorious Hermes at once, How are you able, you crafty rogue, to flay two cows, newborn and babyish as you are? For my part, I dread the strength that will be yours. There is no need you should keep growing long, Silenian, son of Maia. So saying, Apollo twisted strong withes with his hands, meaning to bind Hermes with firm bands. But the bands would not hold him, and the withes of Osier fell far from him, and began to grow at once from the ground beneath their feet in that very place. And intertwining with one another, they quickly grew and covered all the wild roving cattle by the will of thievish Hermes, so that Apollo was astonished as he gazed. Then the strong slayer of Argus looked furtively upon the ground with eyes flashing fire, desiring to hide. Very easily he softened the son of all glorious Leto, as he would, stern though the far-shooter was. He took the lyre upon his left arm and tried each string in turn with the key, so that at his touch it sounded awesomely. And Phoebus Apollo laughed for joy, for the sweet throb of the marvellous music went to his heart, and a soft longing look hold on to his soul as he listened. Then the son of Maia, harping sweetly upon his lyre, took courage and stood at the left hand of Phoebus Apollo, and soon, while he played shrilly on his lyre, he lifted up his voice and sang, and lovely was the sound of his voice that followed. He sang the story of the deathless gods and of the dark earth, how at the first they came to be, and how each one received his portion. First among the gods he honoured Mnemosyne, mother of the muses, in his song, for the son of Maia was of her following. And next the goodly son of Zeus hymned the rest of the immortals according to their order in age, and told how each was born, mentioning all in order as he struck the lyre upon his arm. But Apollo was seized with a longing not to be allayed, and he opened his mouth and spoke winged words to Hermes. Slayer of oxen, trickster, busy one, comrade of the feast, this song of yours is worth fifty cows, and I believe that presently we shall settle our quarrel peacefully. But come now, tell me this, resourceful son of Maia, has this marvellous thing been with you from your birth, or did some god or mortal man give it you, a noble gift, and teach you heavenly song? For wonderful is this new uttered sound I hear, the like of which I vow that no man nor god dwelling on Olympus ever yet has known but you, O thievish son of Maia. What skill is this? What song for desperate cares? What way of song? For verily, here are three things to hand all at once from which to choose, mirth and love and sweet sleep. And though I am a follower of the Olympian muses who love dances and the bright path of song, the full-toned chant and ravishing thrill of flutes, yet I never cared for any of those feats of skill at young men's revels, as I do now for this. I am filled with wonder, O son of Zeus, at your sweet playing. But now, since you, though little, have such glorious skill, sit down, dear boy, and respect the words of your elders. For now you shall have renown among the deathless gods, you and your mother also. This I will declare to you exactly. By this shaft of cornel wood, I will surely make you a leader renowned among the deathless gods, and fortunate, and will give you glorious gifts, and will not deceive you from first to last. Then Hermes answered him with artful words. You question me carefully, O far worker, yet I am not jealous that you should enter upon my art. This day you shall know it, for I seek to be friendly with you both in thought and word. Now you well know all things in your heart, since you sit foremost among the deathless gods, O son of Zeus, and are goodly and strong, and why Zeus loves you as all right is, and has given you splendid gifts. And they say that from the utterance of Zeus you have learned both the honours due to the gods, O far worker, and oracles from Zeus, even all his ordinances. Of all these I myself have already learned that you have great wealth. Now, 
you are free to learn whatever you please. But since, as it seems, your heart is so strongly set on playing the lyre, chant and play upon it, and give yourself to merriment, taking this as a gift from me, and do you, my friend, bestow glory on me. Sing well with this clear-voiced companion in your hands, for you are skilled in good, well-ordered utterance. From now on, bring it confidently to the rich feast, and lovely dance and glorious revel, a joy by night and by day. Whoso with wit and wisdom inquires of it cunningly, him it teaches through its sound all manner of things that delight the mind, being easily played with gentle familiarities, for it abhors toilsome drudgery. But whoso in ignorance inquires of it violently, to him it chatters mere vanity and foolishness. But you are able to learn whatever you please. So then, I will give you this lyre, glorious son of Zeus, while I, for my part, will graze down with wild roving cattle the pastures on hill and horse-feeding plain. So shall the cows covered by the bulls calve abundantly, both males and females. And now there is no need for you, bargainer though you are, to be furiously angry. When Hermes had said this, he held out the lyre, and Phoebus Apollo took it, and readily put his shining whip in Hermes' hand, and ordained him keeper of herds. The son of Maia received it joyfully, while the glorious son of Leto, the lord, far-working Apollo, took the lyre upon his left arm, and tried each string with the key. Awesomely it sounded at the touch of the god, while he sang sweetly to its note. Afterwards they too, the all-glorious sons of Zeus, turned the cows back towards the sacred meadow, but themselves hastened back to snowy Olympus, delighting in the lyre. Then why Zeus was glad, and made them both friends, and Hermes loved the son of Leto continually, even as he does now, when he had given the lyre as token to the far-shooter, who played it skilfully, holding it upon his arm. But for himself, Hermes found out another cunning art, and made himself the pipes, whose sound is heard afar. Then the son of Leto said to Hermes, Son of Maia, guide and cunning one, I fear you may steal from me the lyre and my curved bow together, for you have an office from Zeus to establish deeds of barter amongst men throughout the fruitful earth. Now if you would only swear me the great oath of the gods, either by nodding your head or by the potent water of Styx, you would do all that can please and ease my heart. Then Maia's son nodded his head and promised that he would never steal anything of all the far shooter possessed, and would never go near his strong house. But Apollo, son of Leto, swore to be fellow and friend to Hermes, vowing that he would love no other among the immortals, neither god nor man sprung from Zeus, better than Hermes. And the father sent forth an eagle in confirmation. And Apollo swore also, Verily I will make you only to be an omen for the immortals and all alike, trusted and honoured by my heart. Moreover, I will give you a splendid staff of riches and wealth. It is of gold, with three branches, and will keep you scatheless, accomplishing every task, whether of words or deeds that are good, which I claim to know through the utterance of Zeus. But as for soothsaying, noble heaven-born child of which you ask, it is not lawful for you to learn it, nor for any other of the deathless gods. Only the mind of Zeus knows that. I am pledged and avowed and sworn a strong oath that no other of the eternal gods save I should know the wise-hearted counsel of Zeus. And do not you, my brother, bearer of the golden wand, bid me tell those decrees, which all-seeing Zeus intends. As for men, I will harm one and profit another, sorely perplexing the tribes of unenviable men. Whosoever shall come guided by the call and flight of birds of sure omen, that man shall have advantage through my voice, and I will not deceive him. But whoso shall trust to idly chattering birds, and shall seek to invoke my prophetic art contrary to my will, and to understand more than the eternal gods, I declare that he shall come on an idle journey, yet his gifts I would take. But I will tell you another thing, son of all glorious Maia, and Zeus who holds the ages, luck-bringing genius of the gods. There are certain holy ones, sisters born, three virgins, gifted with wings. 
their heads are besprinkled with white meal, and they dwell under a ridge of Parnassus. These are teachers of divination apart from me, the art which I practised while yet a boy following herds, though my father paid no heed to it. From their home they fly now here, now there, feeding on honeycomb and bringing all things to pass. And when they are inspired through eating yellow honey, they are willing to speak truth. But if they be deprived of the gods' sweet food, then they speak falsely, as they swarm in and out together. These, then, I give you. Inquire of them strictly, and delight your heart. And if you should teach any mortal to do so, often will he hear your response, if he have good fortune. Take these, son of Maia, and tend the wild roving horned oxen and horses and patient mules. So he spake, and from heaven Father Zeus himself gave confirmation to his words, and commanded that glorious Hermes should be lord over all birds of omen and grim-eyed lions, and boars with gleaming tusks, and over dogs, and all flocks that the wide earth nourishes, and over all sheep, also that he only should be the appointed messenger to Hades, who, though he takes no gift, shall give him no mean prize. Thus the Lord Apollo showed his kindness for the son of Maia, by all manner of friendship, and the son of Cronos gave him grace besides. He consorts with all mortals and immortals. A little he profits, but continually throughout the dark night he cousins the tribes of mortal men. And so, farewell, son of Zeus and Maia, but I will remember you. And another song also. End of section four. Section 5 of Homeric Hymns, Epigrams, and Battle of Frogs and Mice by Homer. Translated by Hugh G. Evelyn White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To Aphrodite Muse, tell me the deeds of golden Aphrodite, the Cyprian, who stirs up sweet passion in the gods and subdues the tribes of mortal men and birds that fly in air and all the many creatures that the dry land rears, and all that the sea. All these love the deeds of rich-crowned Cytheria. Yet there are three hearts that she cannot bend nor yet ensnare. First is the daughter of Zeus who holds the aegis, bright-eyed Athena, for she has no pleasure in the deeds of golden Aphrodite, but delights in wars and in the work of Ares, in strifes and battles, and in preparing famous crafts. She first taught earthly craftsmen to make chariots of war, and cars variously wrought with bronze, and she, too, teaches tender maidens in the house, and puts knowledge of goodly arts in each one's mind. Nor does laughter-loving Aphrodite ever tame in love Artemis, the huntress with shafts of gold, for she loves archery and the slaying of wild beasts in the mountains. The lyre also, and dancing, and thrilling cries, and shady woods, and the cities of upright men. Nor yet does the pure maiden Hestia love Aphrodite's works. She was the firstborn child of wily Cronos, and youngest too, by will of Zeus who holds the Aegis, a queenly maid whom both Poseidon and Apollo sought to wed. But she was wholly unwilling, nay, stubbornly refused, and touching the head of Father Zeus who holds the Aegis, she, that fair goddess, swear a great oath, which has in truth been fulfilled, that she would be a maiden all her days. So Zeus the father gave her an high honor instead of marriage, and she has her place in the midst of the house, and has the richest portion. In all the temples of the gods she has a share of honor, and among all mortal men she is chief of the goddesses. Of these three, Aphrodite cannot bend or ensnare the hearts, but of all others there is nothing among the blessed gods or among mortal men that has escaped Aphrodite. Even the heart of Zeus, who delights in thunder, is led astray by her, though he is greatest of all and has the lot of highest majesty. She beguiles even his wise heart, whensoever she pleases, and mates him with mortal women, unknown to Hera, his sister and his wife the grandest far in beauty among the deathless goddesses. Most glorious is she whom wily Cronos with her mother Rhea did beget, 
and Zeus, whose wisdom is everlasting, made her his chaste and careful wife. But upon Aphrodite herself, Zeus cast sweet desire to be joined in love with a mortal man, to the end that, very soon, not even she should be innocent of a mortal's love, lest laughter-loving Aphrodite should one day softly smile and say mockingly among all the gods that she had joined the gods in love with mortal women who bear sons of death to the deathless gods, and had mated the goddesses with mortal men. And so he put in her heart sweet desire for Anchises, who at that time among the steep hills of many fountained Ida was tending cattle, and in shape was like the immortal gods. Therefore, when laughter-loving Aphrodite saw him, she loved him, and terribly desire seized her in her heart. She went to Cyprus, to Paphos, where her precinct is, and fragrant altar, and passed into her sweet-smelling temple. There she went in, and put to the glittering doors, and there the graces bathed her with heavenly oil such as blooms upon the bodies of the eternal gods, oil divinely sweet, which she had by her, filled with fragrance. And laughter-loving Aphrodite put on all her rich clothes, and when she had decked herself with gold, she left sweet-smelling Cyprus, and went in haste towards Troy, swiftly travelling high up among the clouds. So she came to many-fountained Ida, the mother of wild creatures, and went straight to the homestead across the mountains. After her came grey wolves, fawning on her, and grim-eyed lions, and bears, and fleet leopards, ravenous for deer. And she was glad in heart to see them, and put desire in their breasts, so that they all mated, two together, about the shadowy combs. But she herself came to the neat-built shelters, and him she found left quite alone in the homestead, the hero Anchises, who was comely as the gods. All the others were following the herds over the grassy pastures, and he, left quite alone in the homestead, was roaming hither and thither, and playing thrillingly upon the lyre. And Aphrodite, the daughter of Zeus, stood before him, being like a pure maiden in height and mien, that he should not be frightened when he took heed of her with his eyes. Now when Anchises saw her, he marked her well, and wondered at her mien and height and shining garments for she was clad in a robe outshining the brightness of fire, a splendid robe of gold, enriched with all manner of needlework, which shimmered like the moon over her tender breasts, a marvel to see. Also she wore twisted brooches and shining earrings in the form of flowers, and round her soft throat were lovely necklaces. And Anchises was seized with love, and said to her, Hail, lady! Whoever of the blessed ones you are that are come to this house, whether Artemis or Leto or golden Aphrodite or high-born Themis or bright-eyed Athena, or maybe you are one of the graces come hither, who bear the gods' company and are called immortal, or else one of the nymphs who haunt the pleasant woods, or of those who inhabit this lovely mountain and the springs of rivers and grassy meads, I will make you an altar upon a high peak in a far-seen place and will sacrifice rich offerings to you at all seasons. And do you feel kindly towards me, and grant that I may become a man very eminent among the Trojans, and give me strong offspring for the time to come. As for my own self, let me live long and happily, seeing the light of the sun, and come to the threshold of old age, a man prosperous among people. Thereupon Aphrodite, the daughter of Zeus, answered him, Anchises, most glorious of all men born on earth, know that I am no goddess. Why do you liken me to the deathless ones? Nay, I am but a mortal, and a woman was the mother that bare me. Otreus of famous name is my father, if so be you have heard of him, and he reigns over all Phrygia, rich in fortresses. But I know your speech well beside my own, for a Trojan nurse brought me up at home. She took me from my dear mother, and reared me thenceforth when I was a little child. So comes it, then, that I know well your tongue also. And now the slayer of Argus, with the golden wand, has caught me up from the dance of Huntress Artemis, her with the golden arrows. 
for there were many of us, nymphs and marriageable maidens, playing together, and an innumerable company encircled us. From these the slayer of Argus with the golden wand wrapped me away. He carried me over many fields of mortal men, and over much land untilled and unpossessed, where savage wild beasts roam through shady coombs, until I thought never again to touch the life-giving earth with my feet. And he said that I should be called the wedded wife of Anchises, and should bear you goodly children. But when he had told and advised me, he, the strong slayer of Argos, went back to the families of the deathless gods, while I am now come to you, for unbending necessity is upon me. But I beseech you by Zeus and by your noble parents, for no base folk could get such a son as you. Take me now, stainless and unproved in love, and show me to your father and careful mother, and to your brothers sprung from the same stock. I shall be no ill-liking daughter for them, but a likely. Moreover, send a messenger quickly to the swift-horsed Phrygians, to tell my father and my sorrowing mother, and they will send you gold in plenty, and woven stuffs, many splendid gifts. Take these as bride-piece, so do, and then prepare the sweet marriage that is honourable in the eyes of men and deathless gods. When she had so spoken, the goddess put sweet desire in his heart, and Anchises was seized with love, so that he opened his mouth and said, If you are a mortal and a woman was the mother who bare you, and Otreus of famous name is your father, as you say, and if you are come here by the will of Hermes, the immortal guide, and are to be called my wife always, then neither god nor mortal man shall here restrain me till I have lain with you in love right now. No, not even if far-shooting Apollo himself should launch grievous shafts from his silver bow. Willingly would I go down into the house of Hades, O oh, lady, beautiful as the goddesses, once I had gone up to your bed. So speaking, he caught her by the hand, and laughed her loving Aphrodite, with face turned away and lovely eyes downcast crept to the well-spread couch which was already laid with soft coverings for the hero, and upon it lay skins of bears and deep roaring lions, which he himself had slain in the high mountains. And when they had gone up upon the well-fitted bed, first Anchises took off her bright jewellery of pins and twisted brooches and earrings and necklaces, and loosed her girdle and stripped off her bright garments, and laid them down upon a silver-studded seat. Then, by the will of the gods and destiny, he lay with her, a mortal man with an immortal goddess, not clearly knowing what he did. But at the time when the herdsmen drive their oxen and hardy sheep back to the fold from the flowery pastures, even then Aphrodite poured soft sleep upon Anchises, but herself put on her rich raiment. And when the bright goddess had fully clothed herself, she stood by the couch and her head reached to the well-hewn roof-tree. From her cheeks shone unearthly beauty, such as belongs to rich-crowned Cytheria. Then she aroused him from sleep, and opened her mouth, and said, Up, son of Dardanus! Why sleep you so heavily, and consider whether I look as I did when you first saw me with your eyes? So she spake, and he awoke in a moment, and obeyed her, but when he saw the neck and lovely eyes of Aphrodite, he was afraid, and turned his eyes aside another way, hiding his comely face with his cloak. Then he uttered winged words, and entreated her. So soon as I ever saw you with my eyes, goddess, I knew that you were divine, but you did not tell me truly. Yet by Zeus who holds the ages, I beseech you, Leave me not to lead a palsied life among men, but have pity on me, for he who lies with a deathless goddess is no hale man afterwards. Then Aphrodite, the daughter of Zeus, answered him, Anchises, most glorious of mortal men, take courage and be not too fearful in your heart. You need fear no harm from me, nor from the other blessed ones, for you are dear to the gods and you shall have a dear son who shall reign among the Trojans, and children's children after him, springing up continually. 
His name shall be Aeneas, because I felt awful grief in that I laid me in the bed of a mortal man. Yet are those of your race always the most like to gods of all mortal men in beauty and in stature. Verily, wise Zeus carried off golden-haired Ganymedes, because of his beauty, to be amongst the deathless ones, and poured drink for the gods in the house of Zeus, a wonder to see, honoured by all the immortals as he draws the red nectar from the golden bowl. But grief that could not be soothed filled the heart of Tros, for he knew not whither the heaven-sent whirlwind had caught up his dear son so that he mourned him always, unceasingly, until Zeus pitied him and gave him high-stepping horses, such as carry the immortals, as recompense for his son. These he gave him as a gift, and at the command of Zeus, the guide, the slayer of Argus, told him all, and how his son would be deathless and unaging, even as the gods. So when Tros heard these tidings from Zeus, he no longer kept mourning, but rejoiced in his heart, and rode joyfully with his storm-footed horses. So also golden-throned Eos wrapped away Tithonus, who was of your race, and like the deathless gods. And she went to ask the dark-clouded son of Cronos that he should be deathless and live eternally. And Zeus bowed his head to her prayer and fulfilled her desire. Too simple was queenly Eos, she thought not in her heart to ask youth for him, and to strip him of the slough of deadly age. So while he enjoyed the sweet flower of life, he lived rapturously with golden-throned Eos, the early-born, by the streams of ocean, at the ends of the earth. But when the first grey hairs began to ripple from his comely head and noble chin, Queenly Eos kept away from his bed, though she cherished him in her house, and nourished him with food and ambrosia, and gave him rich clothing. But when loathsome old age pressed full upon him, and he could not move nor lift his limbs, this seemed to her in her heart the best counsel. She laid him in a room, and put to the shining doors. There he babbles endlessly, and no more has strength at all, such as once he had in his supple limbs. I would not have you be deathless among the deathless gods, and live continually after such sort. Yet if you could live on such as now you are, in look and in form, and be called my husband, sorrow would not then enfold my careful heart. But as it is, harsh old age will soon enshroud you ruthless age which stands some day at the side of every man deadly wearying dreaded even by the gods and now because of you i shall have great shame among the deathless gods henceforth continually for until now they feared my jibes in the wiles by which or soon or late i mated all the immortals with mortal women making them all subject to my will but now my mouth shall no more have this power among the gods, for very great has been my madness, my miserable and dreadful madness, and I went astray out of my mind, who have gotten a child beneath my girdle, mating with a mortal man. As for the child, as soon as he sees the light of the sun, the deep-breasted mountain nymphs who inhabit this great and holy mountain shall bring him up. They rank neither with mortals nor with immortals. Long indeed do they live, eating heavenly food and treading the lovely dance among the immortals, and with them the Silene and the sharp-eyed slayer of Argus mate in the depths of pleasant caves. But at their birth pines or high-topped oaks spring up with them upon the fruitful earth beautiful, flourishing trees, towering high upon the lofty mountains and men call them holy places of the immortals, and never mortal lops them with the axe. But when the fate of death is near at hand, first those lovely trees wither where they stand, and the bark shrivels away about them, and the twigs fall down, and at last the life of the nymph and of the tree leave the light of the sun together. These nymphs shall keep my son with them and rear him, 
and as soon as he is come to lovely boyhood, the goddesses will bring him here to you, and show you your child. But, that I may tell you all that I have in mind, I will come here again towards the fifth year, and bring you my son. So soon as ever you have seen him, a scion to delight the eyes, you will rejoice in beholding him, for he shall be most godlike. Then bring him at once to windy Ilion. And if any mortal man ask you who got your dear son beneath her girdle, remember to tell him as I bid you. Say he is the offspring of one of the flower-like nymphs who inhabit this forest-clad hill. But if you tell all and foolishly boast that you lay with rich-crowned Aphrodite, Zeus will smite you in his anger with a smoking thunderbolt. Now I have told you all, take heed, refrain and name me not, but have regard to the anger of the gods. When the goddess had so spoken, she soared up to windy heaven. Hail, goddess, queen of well-builded Cyprus, with you have I begun. Now I will turn me to another hymn. To Aphrodite I will sing of stately Aphrodite, gold-crowned and beautiful, whose dominion is the walled cities of all sea-set Cyprus. There the moist breath of the western wind wafted her over the waves of the loud moaning sea in soft foam, and there the gold-filleted hours welcomed her joyously. They clothed her with heavenly garments, on her head they put a fine, well-wrought crown of gold, and in her pierced ears they hung ornaments of oracle and precious gold, and adorned her with golden necklaces over her soft neck and snow-white breasts, jewels which the gold-filleted hours wear themselves whenever they go to their father's house to join the lovely dances of the gods. And when they had fully decked her, they brought her to the gods, who welcomed her when they saw her, giving her their hands. Each one of them prayed that he might lead her home to be his wedded wife. So greatly were they amazed at the beauty of violet-crowned Cytheria. Hail, sweetly winning, coy-eyed goddess! Grant that I may gain the victory in this contest, and order you my song. And now I will remember you, and another song also. End of section 5section six of homeric hymns epigrams and battle of frogs and mice by homer translated by hugh g evelyn white this librivox recording is in the public domain to dionysus i will tell of dionysus the son of glorious semele how he appeared on a jutting headland by the shore of the fruitless sea seeming like a stripling in the first flush of manhood his rich dark hair was waving about him and on his strong shoulders he wore a purple robe. Presently there came swiftly over the sparkling sea Tyrsenian pirates on a well-decked ship. A miserable doom led them on. When they saw him, they made signs to one another and sprang out quickly, and seizing him straightway, put him on board their ship exultingly, for they thought him the son of heaven-nurtured kings. They sought to bind him with rude bonds, but the bonds would not hold him and the wives fell far away from his hands and feet, and he sat with a smile in his dark eyes. Then the helmsman understood all, and cried out at once to his fellows, and said, Madmen, what god is this whom you have taken and bind strong that he is? Not even the well-built ship can carry him. Surely this is either Zeus or Apollo who has the silver bow, or Poseidon for he looks not like mortal men, but like the gods who dwell on Olympus. Come then, let us set him free upon the dark shore at once. Do not lay hands on him, lest he grow angry and stir up dangerous winds and heavy squalls. So said he, but the master chid him with taunting words. Madmen, mark the wind and help hoist sail on the ship. Catch all the sheets. As for this fellow, we men will see to him. 
I reckon he is bound for Egypt, or for Cyprus, or to the Hyperboreans, or further still. But in the end he will speak out and tell us his friends, and all his wealth, and his brothers, now that Providence has thrown him in our way. When he had said this, he had mast and sail hoisted on the ship, and the wind filled the sail, and the crew hauled taut the sheets on either side. But soon strange things were seen among them. First of all, sweet fragrant wine ran streaming throughout all the black ship, and a heavenly smell arose, so that all the seamen were seized with amazement when they saw it. And all at once a vine spread out both ways along the top of the sail, with many clusters hanging down from it and a dark ivy plant twined about the mast, blossoming with flowers, and with rich berries growing on it, and all the tholepins were covered with garlands. When the pirates saw all this, then at last they bade the helmsman to put the ship to land, but the god changed into a dreadful lion there on the ship, in the bows, and roared loudly. Amidships also he showed his wonders, and created a shaggy bear, which stood up ravening, while on the forepeak was the lion glaring fiercely with scowling brows. And so the sailors fled into the stern, and crowded bemused about the right-minded helmsman, until suddenly the lion sprang upon the master, and seized him. And when the sailors saw it, they leapt out overboard, one and all, into the bright sea, escaping from a miserable fate, and were changed into dolphins. But on the helmsman Dionysus had mercy, and held him back and made him altogether happy, saying to him, Take courage, good, you have found favour with my heart. I am loud crying Dionysus, whom Cadmus's daughter Semele bear of union with Zeus. Hail, child of fair-faced Semele! He who forgets you can in no wise order sweet song. To Ares Ares, exceeding in strength, chariot rider, golden helmed, doughty in heart, shield bearer, saviour of cities, harnessed in bronze, strong of arm, unwearying, mighty with the spear, O defence of Olympus, father of warlike victory, ally of Themis, stern governor of the rebellious, leader of righteous men, sceptred king of manliness, who whirl your fiery sphere among the planets in their sevenfold courses through the ether, wherein your blazing steeds ever bear you above the third firmament of heaven. Hear me, helper of men, giver of dauntless youth. Shed down a kindly ray from above upon my life, and strength of war, that I may be able to drive away bitter cowardice from my head, and crush down the deceitful impulses of my soul. Restrain also the keen fury of my heart, which provokes me to tread the ways of blood-curdling strife. Rather, O oh, blessed one, give you me boldness to abide within the harmless laws of peace, avoiding strife and hatred, and the violent fiends of death. To Artemis. Muse, sing of Artemis, sister of the far shooter, the virgin who delights in arrows, who was fostered with Apollo. She waters her horses from mellies deep in reeds, and swiftly drives her all golden chariot through Smyrna, divine clad Claros, where Apollo, god of the silver bow, sits waiting for the far shooting goddess who delights in arrows. And so hail to you, Artemis in my song, and to all goddesses as well. Of you first I sing, and with you I begin. Now that I have begun with you, I will turn to another song. To Aphrodite Of Cytheria, born in Cyprus, I will sing. She gives kindly gifts to men. Smiles are ever on her lovely face and lovely is the brightness that plays over it. Hail, goddess, queen of well-built Salamis and sea-girt Cyprus. Grant me a cheerful song, and now I will remember you, and another song also. 
TO ATHENA Of Pallas Athena, guardian of the city, I begin to sing. Dread is she, and with Ares she loves deeds of war, the sack of cities and the shouting and the battle. It is she who saves the people as they go out to war and come back. Hail, goddess, and give us good fortune with happiness. To Hera I sing of golden-throned Hera, whom Rhea bear. Queen of the immortals is she, surpassing all in beauty. She is the sister and the wife of loud-thundering Zeus, the glorious one whom all the blessed throughout high Olympus reverence and honour, even as Zeus, who delights in thunder. To Demeter I begin to sing of rich-haired Demeter, awful goddess, of her and of her daughter lovely Persephone. Hail, goddess, keep this city safe, and govern my song. To the Mother of the Gods I prithee, clear-voiced muse, daughter of mighty Zeus, sing of the mother of all gods and men. She is well pleased with the sound of rattles and of timbrels, with the voice of flutes and the outcry of wolves and bright-eyed lions, with echoing hills and wooded coombs. And so hail to you in my song, and to all goddesses as well. To Heracles the Lion-Hearted I will sing of Heracles, the son of Zeus, and much the mightiest of men on earth. Alcmena bare him in Thebes, the city of lovely dances, when the dark-clouded son of Cronos had lain with her. Once he used to wander over unmeasured tracts of land and sea at the bidding of King Eurystheus, and himself did many deeds of violence and endured many. But now he lives happily in the glorious home of snowy Olympus, and has neat-ankled Hebe for his wife. Hail, Lord, son of Zeus! Give me success and prosperity. To Asclepius I begin to sing of Asclepius, son of Apollo, and healer of sicknesses. In the Docian plain, fair Coronis, daughter of King Phlegias, bear him, a great joy to men, a soother of cruel pangs. And so hail to you, Lord, in my song I make my prayer to thee. To the Dioscuri Sing, clear-voiced muse, of Castor and Polydukes, the Tyndaridae who sprang from Olympian Zeus. Beneath the heights of Tegetus stately Leda bare them, when the dark-clouded son of Cronos had privily bent her to his will. Hail, children of Tyndareus, riders upon swift horses. To Hermes I sing of Cyllenian Hermes, the slayer of Argus, lord of Cyllene in Arcadia rich in flocks, luck-bringing messenger of the deathless gods. He was born of Maia, the daughter of Atlas, when she had mated with Zeus, a shy goddess she. Ever she avoided the throng of the blessed gods, and lived in a shadowy cave. And there the son of Cronos used to lie with the rich-tressed nymph at dead of night, while white-armed Hera lay bound in sweet sleep and neither deathless god nor mortal man knew it. And so hail to you, son of Zeus and Maia. With you I have begun. Now I will turn to another song. Hail Hermes, giver of grace, guide and giver of good things. To Pan Muse, tell me about Pan, the dear son of Hermes, with his goat's feet and two horns, a lover of merry noise. Through wooded glades he wanders with dancing nymphs who foot it on some sheer cliff's edge, calling upon Pan, the shepherd god, long-haired, unkempt. He has every snowy crest and the mountain peaks and rocky crests for his domain. Hither and thither he goes through the close thickets, now lured by soft streams, and now he presses on amongst towering crags and climbs up to the highest peak that overlooks the flocks. 
Often he courses through the glistening high mountains, and often on the shouldered hills he speeds along slaying wild beasts, this keen-eyed god. Only at evening, as he returns from the chase, he sounds his note, playing sweet and low on his pipes of reed. Not even she could excel him in melody, that bird who in flower-laden spring, pouring forth her lament, utters honey-voiced song amid the leaves. At that hour the clear-voiced nymphs are with him, and move with nimble feet, singing by some spring of dark water, while Echo wails about the mountain top, and the god on this side or on that of the choirs, or at times sidling into the midst, plies it nimbly with his feet. On his back he wears a spotted lynx pelt, and he delights in high-pitched songs, in a soft meadow where crocuses and sweet-smelling hyacinths bloom at random in the grass. They sing of the blessed gods and high Olympus, and choose to tell of such an one as luck-bringing Hermes above the rest, how he is the swift messenger of all the gods, and how he came to Arcadia, the land of many springs and mother of flocks, there where his sacred place is as a god of Silene. For there, though a god, he used to tend curly-fleeced sheep in the service of a mortal man, because there fell on him and waxed strong melting desire to wed the rich-tressed daughter of Dryops. And there he brought about the merry marriage. And in the house she bare Hermes a dear son, who from his birth was marvellous to look upon, with goat's feet and two horns, a noisy, merry-laughing child. But when the nurse saw his uncouth face and full beard, she was afraid, and sprang up and fled and left the child. Then, luck-bringing Hermes received him and took him in his arms, very glad in his heart was the god. And he went quickly to the abodes of the deathless gods, carrying his son wrapped in warm skins of mountain hairs, and set him down beside Zeus and showed him to the rest of the gods. Then all the immortals were glad in heart, and Bacchic Dionysus in especial, and they called the boy Pan, because he delighted all their hearts. And so, hail to you, Lord, I seek your favour with a song, and now I will remember you, and another song also. End of section 6《Section 7 of Homeric Hymns, Epigrams, and Battle of Frogs and Mice by Homer, translated by Hugh G. Evelyn White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To Hephaestus Sing, clear-voiced muse of Hephaestus, famed for inventions. With bright-eyed Athena he taught men glorious crafts throughout the world, men who before used to dwell in caves in the mountains like wild beasts. But now that they have learned crafts through Hephaestus, the famed worker, easily they live a peaceful life in their own houses the whole year round. Be gracious, Hephaestus, and grant me success and prosperity. To Apollo Phoebus, of you even the swan sings with clear voice to the beating of his wings as he alights upon the bank by the eddying river Peneus and of you the sweet-tongued minstrel, holding his high-pitched lyre, always sings both first and last. And so, hail to you, Lord, I seek your favour with my song. To Poseidon I begin to sing about Poseidon, the great god, mover of the earth and fruitless sea, god of the deep, who is also lord of Helicon and wide Aegae. A twofold office the gods allotted you, O shaker of the earth, to be a tamer of horses and a savior of ships. Hail, Poseidon, holder of the earth, dark-haired lord. O blessed one, be kindly in heart, and help those who voyage in ships. To the son of Kronos, most high. I will sing of Zeus chiefest among the gods and greatest, all-seeing, the lord of all, the fulfiller who whispers words of wisdom to Themis as she sits leaning towards him. Be gracious, all-seeing son of Kronos, most excellent and great. 
to Hestia. Hestia, you who tend the holy house of the Lord Apollo, the far-shooter at goodly Pytho, with soft oil dripping ever from your locks, come now into this house, come, having one mind with Zeus the all-wise, draw near, and withal bestow grace upon my song. To the Muses and Apollo I will begin with the Muses and Apollo and Zeus. For it is through the Muses and Apollo that there are singers upon the earth and players upon the lyre, but kings are from Zeus. Happy is he whom the Muses love, sweet flows speech from his lips. Hail, children of Zeus, give honour to my song, and now I will remember you and another song also. To Dionysus I begin to sing of ivy-crowned Dionysus, the loud-crying god, splendid son of Zeus, and glorious Semele. The rich-haired nymphs received him in their bosoms from the Lord his father, and fostered and nurtured him carefully in the dells of Nysa, where by the will of his father he grew up in a sweet-smelling cave, being reckoned among the immortals. But when the goddesses had brought him up, a god oft hymned, then began he to wander continually through the woody combs, thickly wreathed with ivy and laurel, and the nymphs followed in his train with him for their leader, and the boundless forest was filled with their outcry. And so hail to you, Dionysus, god of abundant clusters. Grant that we may come again rejoicing to this season, and from that season onwards for many a year. To Artemis. I sing of Artemis, whose shafts are of gold, who cheers on the hounds, the pure maiden, shooter of stags, who delights in archery, own sister to Apollo with the golden sword. Over the shadowy hills and windy peaks, she draws her golden bow, rejoicing in the chase, and sends out grievous shafts. The tops of the high mountains tremble, and the tangled wood echoes awesomely with the outcry of beasts. Earth quakes, and the sea also, where fishes shoal. But the goddess with a bold heart turns every way, destroying the race of wild beasts. And when she is satisfied and has cheered her heart, this huntress who delights in arrows, slackens her supple bow, and goes to the great house of her dear brother Phoebus Apollo, to the rich land of Delphi, there to order the lovely dance of the muses and graces. There she hangs up her curved bow and her arrows, and heads and leads the dances, gracefully arrayed, while all they utter their heavenly voice, singing how neat-ankled Leto bear children supreme among the immortals, both in thought and in deed. Hail to you, children of Zeus and rich-haired Leto, and now I will remember you, and another song also. To Athena. I begin to sing of Pallas Athena, the glorious goddess, bright-eyed, inventive, unbending of heart, pure virgin, saviour of cities, courageous, tritogenia. Why Zeus himself bear her from his awful head, arrayed in warlike arms of flashing gold, and awe seized all the gods as they gazed. But Athena sprang quickly from the immortal head, and stood before Zeus who holds the Aegis, shaking a sharp spear. Great Olympus began to reel horribly at the might of the bright-eyed goddess, and earth round about cried fearfully, and the sea was moved and tossed with dark waves, while foam burst forth suddenly. The bright son of Hyperion stopped his swift-footed horses a long while, until the maiden Pallas Athena had stripped the heavenly armor from her immortal shoulders and wise Zeus was glad. And so hail to you, daughter of Zeus who holds the Aegis. Now I will remember you, and another song as well. To Hestia Hestia, in the high dwellings of all, both deathless gods and men who walk on earth, you have gained an everlasting abode and highest honor. Glorious is your portion and your right for without you mortals hold no banquet. 
where one does not duly pour sweet wine in offering to Hestia both first and last. And you, slayer of Argus, son of Zeus and Maia, messenger of the blessed gods, bearer of the golden rod, giver of good, be favourable and help us, you and Hestia, the worshipful and dear. Come and dwell in this glorious house in friendship together, for you too, well knowing the noble actions of men, aid on their wisdom and their strength. Hail, daughter of Kronos, and you also, Hermes, bearer of the golden rod. Now I will remember you, and another song also. To Earth, the Mother of All I will sing of well-founded Earth, Mother of All, eldest of all beings. She feeds all creatures that are in the world, all that go upon the goodly land, and all that are in the paths of the seas, and all that fly. All these are fed of her store. Through you, O Queen, men are blessed in their children and blessed in their harvests, and to you it belongs to give means of life to mortal men and to take it away. Happy is the man whom you delight to honour. He has all things abundantly. His fruitful land is laden with corn, his pastures are covered with cattle, and his house is filled with good things. Such men rule orderly in their cities of fair women. Great riches and wealth follow them. Their sons exult with ever-fresh delight, and their daughters in flower-laden bands play and skip merrily over the soft flowers of the field. Thus it is with those whom you honour, O holy goddess, bountiful spirit. Hail, mother of the gods, wife of starry heaven, freely bestow upon me for this my song substance that cheers the heart. And now I will remember you, and another song also. To Helios And now, O muse Calliope, daughter of Zeus, begin to sing of glowing Helios, whom mild-eyed Euryphasa, the far-shining one, bare to the sun of earth and starry heaven. For Hyperion wedded glorious Euryphasa, his own sister, who bare him lovely children, rosy-armed Eos and rich-tressed Selene, and tireless Helios, who is like the deathless gods. As he rides in his chariot, he shines upon men and deathless gods, and piercingly he gazes with his eyes from his golden helmet. Bright rays beam dazzlingly from him, and his bright locks streaming from the temples of his head gracefully enclose his far-seen face. A rich, fine-spun garment glows upon his body and flutters in the wind, and stallions carry him. Then, when he has stayed his golden-yoked chariot and horses, he rests there upon the highest point of heaven, until he marvellously drives them down again through heaven to ocean. Hail to you, Lord! Freely bestow on me substance that cheers the heart. And now that I have begun with you, I will celebrate the race of mortal men half divine, whose deeds the muses have showed to mankind. To Selene. And next, sweet-voiced muses, daughters of Zeus, well-skilled in song, tell of the long-winged moon. From her immortal head a radiance is shown from heaven and embraces earth, and great is the beauty that ariseth from her shining light. The air, unlit before, glows with the light of her golden crown, and her rays beam clear, whensoever bright Selene, having bathed her lovely body in the waters of ocean, and donned her far-gleaming raiment, and yoked her strong-necked shining team, drives on her long-maned horses at full speed, at even time in the mid-month. Then her great orbit is full, and then her beams shine brightest as she increases. So she is sure token and a sign to mortal men. Once the son of Cronos was joined with her in love, and she conceived and bare a daughter Pandia, exceedingly lovely amongst the deathless gods. Hail, white-armed goddess, bright Selene, mild, bright-tressed queen, 
And now I will leave you, and sing the glories of men half divine, whose deeds, minstrels, the servants of the muses, celebrate with lovely lips. To the Dioscuri Bright-eyed muses, tell of the Tyndaridae, the sons of Zeus, glorious children of neat-ankled Leda, Castor the tamer of horses, and blameless Polydukes. When Leda had lain with the dark-clouded son of Cronos, she bare them beneath the peak of the great hill Tegetus, children who are deliverers of men on earth and of swift-going ships when stormy gales rage over the ruthless sea. Then the shipmen call upon the sons of great Zeus with vows of white lambs going to the forepart of the prow. But the strong wind and the waves of the sea lay the ship under water, until suddenly these two are seen darting through the air on tawny wings. Forthwith they allay the blasts of the cruel winds, and still the waves upon the surface of the white sea. Fair signs are they, and deliverance from toil. And when the shipmen see them, they are glad, and have rest from their pain and labor. Hail, Tindaridae, riders upon swift horses. Now I will remember you, and another song also. End of Section 7Section 8 of Homeric Hymns, Epigrams, and Battle of Frogs and Mice by Homer. Translated by Hugh G. Evelyn White. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Epigrams Have reverence for him who needs a home and a stranger's dole. All ye who dwell in the high city of Kymi, the lovely maiden, hard by the foothills of lofty Sardini, ye who drink the heavenly water of the divine stream, eddying Hermas, whom deathless Zeus begot. Speedily may my feet bear me to some town of righteous men, for their hearts are generous, and their wit is best. I am a maiden of bronze, and am set upon the tomb of Midas. While the waters flow, and tall trees flourish, and the sun rises and shines, and the bright moon also, while rivers run and the sea breaks on the shore, ever remaining on this mournful tomb, I tell the passer-by that Midas here lies buried. To what a fate did Zeus the father give me a prey, even while he made me to grow, a babe at my mother's knee? By the will of Zeus who holds the ages, the people of Phrycon, riders of wanton horses, more active than raging fire in the test of war, once built the towers of Aeolian Smyrna, wave-shaken neighbor to the sea, through which glides the pleasant stream of sacred Meles. Thence arose the daughters of Zeus, glorious children, and would fain have made famous that fair country and the city of its people. But in their folly those men scorned the divine voice and renown of song, and in trouble shall one of them remember this hereafter, he who with scornful words to them contrived my fate. Yet I will endure the lot which heaven gave me, even at my birth, bearing my disappointment with a patient heart. My dear limbs you're not to stay in the sacred streets of Kymi, but rather my great heart urges me to go unto another country, small though I am. Thestorides, full of many things there are that mortals cannot sound, but there is nothing more unfathomable than the heart of man. Hear me, Poseidon, strong shaker of the earth, ruler of widespread tawny Helicon, give a fair wind and a sight of safe return to the shipmen who speed and govern this ship and grant that when I come to the nether slopes of towering Mimas, I may find honourable, God-fearing men. Also, may I avenge me on the wretch who deceived me and grieved Zeus, the lord of guests, and his own guest-table. Queen Earth, all bounteous giver of honey-hearted wealth, how kindly it seems you are to some! 
and how intractable and rough for those with whom you are angry! Sailors who rove the seas, and whom a hateful fate has made as the shy sea-fowl, living an unenviable life, observe the reverence due to Zeus, who rules on high, the god of strangers. For terrible is the vengeance of this god afterwards, for whosoever has sinned. Strangers, a contrary wind has caught you, but even now take me aboard, and you shall make your voyage. Another sort of pine shall bear a better fruit than you upon the heights of furrowed windy Ida. For there shall mortal men get the iron that Ares loves, so soon as the Sabrinians shall hold the land. Glaucus, watchman of flocks, a word I will put in your heart. First, give the dogs their dinner at the courtyard gate, for this is well. The dog first hears a man approaching, and the wild beast coming to the fence. Goddess nurse of the young, give ear to my prayer, and grant that this woman may reject the love embraces of youth, and dote on grey-haired old men, whose powers are dulled, but whose hearts still desire. Children are a man's crown, towers of a city, horses are the glory of a plain, and so are ships of the sea. Wealth will make a house great, and reverend princes seated in assembly are a goodly sight for the folk to see. But a blazing fire makes a house look more comely upon a winter's day, when the son of Cronos sends down snow. Potters, if you will give me a reward, I will sing for you. Come then, Athena, with hand upraised over the kiln. Let the pots and all the dishes turn out well, and be well fired. Let them fetch good prices, and be sold in plenty in the market, and plenty in the streets. Grant that the potters may get great gain, and grant me so to sing to them. But... If you turn shameless and make false promises, then I call together the destroyers of kilns, shatter and smash and char and crash and crude bake, who can work this craft much mischief. Come all of you and sack the kiln yard and the buildings. Let the whole kiln be shaken up to the potter's loud lament. As a horse jaw grinds, so let the kiln grind to powder all the pots inside. And you too, daughter of the sun, Circe the witch, come and cast cruel spells, hurt both these men and their handiwork. Let Chiron also come, and bring many centaurs, all that escaped the hands of Heracles, and all that were destroyed. Let them make sad havoc of the pots, and overthrow the kiln, and let the potters see the mischief and be grieved. But I will gloat as I behold their luckless craft, and if any one of them stoops to peer in, let all his face be burned up, that all men may learn to deal honestly. Let us betake to the house of some man of great power, one who bears great power and is greatly prosperous always. Open of yourselves, you doors, for mighty wealth will enter in, and with wealth comes jolly mirth and gentle peace. May all the corn bins be full, and the mass of dough always overflowing the kneading trough. Now set before us cheerful barley potage, full of sesame. Your son's wife, driving to this house with strong-hoofed mules, shall dismount from her carriage to greet you. May she be shod with golden shoes as she stands weaving at the loom. I come, and I come yearly, like the swallow that perches light-footed in the forepart of your house, but quickly bring if you will give us anything well, but if not, we will not wait, for we are not come here to dwell with you. Homer, hunters of deep sea prey, have we caught anything? Fisherman, all that we caught we left behind, and all that we did not catch we carry home. Homer, 
Aye, for of such fathers you are sprung as neither hold rich lands nor tend countless sheep. End of section 8《ハモリカムズ・エピグラムズ・バトル・オブ・フロッグ・アンド・マイス・バイ・ホーマー・トランスレーター・ヒュー・ジー・エヴェリン・ワイト・ LibriVox Recording Is In The Public Domain Section Nine of Homeric Hymns, Epigrams, and Battle of Frogs and Mice The Battle of Frogs and Mice Here I begin, and first I pray the choir of muses to come down from Helicon into my heart to aid the lay which I have newly written in tablets upon my knee. Fain would I sound in all men's ears that awful strife, that clamorous deed of war, and tell how the mice proved their valor on the frogs, and rivaled the exploits of the giants, those earth-born men, as the tale was told among mortals. Thus did the war begin. One day a thirsty mouse who had escaped the ferret, dangerous foe, set his soft muzzle to the lake's brink, and reveled in the sweet water. There a loud-voiced pond-larker spied him, and uttered such words as these, Stranger, who are you? Whence come you to this shore, and who is he who begot you? Tell me all this truly, and let me not find you lying, for if I find you worthy to be my friend, I will take you to my house, and give you many noble gifts, such as men give to their guests. I am the King Puffjaw, and am honoured in all the pond, being ruler of the frogs continually. The father that brought me up was Mudman, who mated with Water Lady by the banks of Eridanus. I see, indeed, that you are well-looking, and stouter than the ordinary, a sceptred king and a warrior in fight. But come, make haste, and tell me your descent. Then Crumbsnatcher answered him, and said, Why do you ask my race, which is well known amongst all, both men and gods, and the birds of heaven? Crumbsnatcher am I called, and I am the son of Bread Nibbler. He was my stout-hearted father, and my mother was Cornlicker, the daughter of Hamnar the king. She bare me in the mouse hole, and nourished me with food, figs, and nuts, and dainties of all kinds. But how are you to make me your friend, who am altogether different in nature? For you get your living in the water, but I am used to eat such foods as men have. I never miss the thrice-kneaded loaf in its neat round basket, or the thin-wrapped cake full of sesame and cheese, or the slice of ham or liver vested in white fat, or cheese just curdled from sweet milk, or delicious honey cake, which even the blessed gods long for, or any of all those cakes which cooks make for the feasts of mortal men, larding their pots and pans with spices of all kinds. In battle I have never flinched from the cruel onset, but plunged straight into the fray and fought among the foremost. I fear not man, though he has a big body, but run along his bed, and bite the tip of his toe, and nibble at his heel, and the man feels no hurt, and his sweet sleep is not broken by my biting. But there are two things I fear above all else the whole world over, the hawk and the ferret, for these bring great grief on me, and the piteous trap wherein is treacherous death. Most of all, I fear the ferret of the keener sort, which follows you still even when you dive down your hole. I gnaw no radishes and cabbages and pumpkins, nor feed on green leeks and parsley, for these are food for you who live in the lake. Then Puffjaw answered him with a smile, Stranger, you boast too much of belly matters. We, too, have many marvels to be seen both in the lake and on shore, for the son of Kronos has given us frogs the power to lead a double life, dwelling at will in two separate elements, and so we both leap on land and plunge beneath the water. If you would learn of all these things, tis easy done. Just mount upon my back, and hold me tight lest you be lost, 
and so you shall come rejoicing to my house. So said he, and offered his back, and the mouse mounted at once, putting his paws upon the other's sleek neck and vaulting nimbly. While he still saw the land near by, he was pleased and was delighted with Puff Jaw's swimming. But when dark waves began to wash over him, he wept loudly and blamed his unlucky change of mind. He tore his fur and tucked his paws in against his belly, while within him his heart quaked by reason of the strangeness, and he longed to get to land, groaning terribly through the stress of chilling fear. He put out his tail upon the water, and worked it like a steering oar, and prayed to heaven that he might get to land. But when the dark waves washed over him, he cried aloud, and said, Not in such wise did the bull bear on his back the beloved load, when he brought Europa across the sea to Crete, as this frog carries me over the water to his house, raising his yellow back in the pale water. Then suddenly a water snake appeared, a horrid sight for both alike, and held his neck upright above the water. And when he saw it, Puffjaw dived at once, and never thought how helpless a friend he would leave perishing. But down to the bottom of the lake he went, and escaped black death. But the mouse, so deserted, at once fell on his back in the water. He wrung his paws and squeaked in agony of death. Many times he sank beneath the water, and many times he rose up again, kicking. But he could not escape his doom, for his wet fur weighed him down heavily. Then at the last, as he was dying, he uttered these words. Ah, Puffjaw, you shall not go unpunished for this treachery. You threw me, a castaway, off your body as from a rock. Vile coward! On land you would not have been the better man, boxing or wrestling or running. But now you have tricked me and cast me in the water. Heaven has an avenging eye, and surely the host of mice will punish you and not let you escape. With these words he breathed out his soul upon the water. But Lick Platter, as he sat upon the soft bank, saw him die, and raising a dreadful cry, ran and told the mice. And when they heard of his fate, all the mice were seized with fierce anger, and bade their herald summon the people to assemble towards dawn at the house of Bread Nibbler, the father of hapless Crumb Snatcher who lay outstretched on the water, face up, a lifeless corpse. And no longer near the bank, poor wretch, but floating in the midst of the deep. And when the mice came in haste at dawn, Bread Nibbler stood up first, enraged at his son's death, and thus he spoke. Friends, even if I alone had suffered great wrong from the frogs, Assuredly, this is a first essay at mischief for you all. And now I am pitiable, for I have lost three sons. First, the abhorred ferret seized and killed one of them, catching him outside the hole. Then ruthless men dragged another to his doom, when by unheard of arts they had contrived a wooden snare, a destroyer of mice, which they call a trap. There was a third whom I and his dear mother loved well, and him Puffjaw has carried out into the deep and drowned. Come then, and let us arm ourselves, and go out against them when we have arrayed ourselves in rich-wrought arms. With such words he persuaded them all to gird themselves, and Ares, who has charge of war, equipped them. First they fastened on greaves, and covered their shins with green bean-pods, broken into two parts, which they had gnawed out, standing over them all night. Their breastplates were of skin stretched on reeds, skillfully made from a ferret they had flayed. For shields each had the centerpiece of a lamp, and their spears were long needles, all of bronze, 
the work of Ares, and the helmets upon their temples were peanut shells. So the mice armed themselves. But when the frogs were aware of it, they rose up out of the water, and coming together to one place gathered a council of grievous war. And while they were asking whence the quarrel arose, and what the cause of this anger, a herald drew near, bearing a wand in his paws. Pot Visitor, the son of great-hearted cheese carver, he brought the grim message of war, speaking thus. Frogs, the mice have sent me with their threats against you, and bid you arm yourselves for war and battle. For they have seen Crumbsnatcher in the water, whom your king Puffjaw slew. Fight then, as many of you as are warriors among the frogs. With these words he explained the matter. So when this blameless speech came to their ears, the proud frogs were disturbed in their hearts, and began to blame Puffjaw. But he rose up and said, Friends, I killed no mouse, nor did I see one perishing. Surely he was drowned while playing by the lake and imitating the swimming of the frogs, and now these wretches blame me, who am guiltless. Come then, let us take counsel how we may utterly destroy the wily mice. Moreover, I will tell you what I think to be the best. Let us all gird on our armour, and take our stand on the very brink of the lake, where the ground breaks down sheer. Then, when they come out and charge upon us, let each seize by the crest the mouse who attacks him, and cast them with their helmets into the lake. For so we shall drown these dry hobs in the water, and merrily set up here a trophy of victory over the slaughtered mice. By this speech he persuaded them to arm themselves. They covered their shins with leaves of mallows, and had breastplates made of fine green beet leaves and cabbage leaves, skillfully fashioned for shields. Each one was equipped with a long pointed rush for a spear, and smooth snail shells to cover their heads. Then they stood in close locked ranks upon the high bank, waving their spears, and were filled, each of them, with courage. Now Zeus called the gods to starry heaven, and showed them the martial throng and the stout warriors, so many and so great, all bearing long spears, for they were as the host of the centaurs and the giants. Then he asked with a sly smile, Who of the deathless gods will help the frogs, and who the mice? And he said to Athena, My daughter, Will you go aid the mice? For they all frolic about your temple continually, delighting in the fat of sacrifice and in all kinds of food. So then said the son of Cronos. But Athena answered him, I would never go to help the mice when they are hard pressed, for they have done me much mischief, spoiling my garlands and my lamps too to get the oil. And this thing that they have done vexes my heart exceedingly. They have eaten holes in my sacred robe, which I wove painfully spinning a fine woof on a fine warp, and made it full of holes. And now the money lender is at me and charges me interest, which is a bitter thing for immortals, for I borrowed to do my weaving, and have nothing with which to repay. Yet even so I will not help the frogs, for they also are not considerable. Once, when I was returning early from war, I was very tired, and though I wanted to sleep, they would not let me even doze a little for their outcry. And so I lay sleepless with a headache until cock-crow. No, gods, let us refrain from helping these hosts, or one of us may get wounded with a sharp spear, for they fight hand to hand, even if a god comes against them. Let us rather all amuse ourselves, watching the fight from heaven. So said Athena, and the other gods agreed with her, and all went in a body to one place. Then gnats with great trumpets 
sounded the fell note of war, and Zeus, the son of Cronos, thundered from heaven, a sign of grievous battle. First, Loud Croaker wounded Lickman in the belly, right through the midriff. Down he fell on his face and soiled his soft fur in the dust. He fell with a thud, and his armor clashed about him. Next, Troglodyte shot at the son of Mudman, and drove the strong spear deep into his breast. So he fell, and black death seized him, and his spirit flitted forth from his mouth. Then Beatty struck Pot Visitor to the heart, and killed him, and Bread Nibbler hit Loudcrier in the belly, so that he fell on his face, and his spirit flitted forth from his limbs. Now when Pondlarker saw Loudcrier perishing, he struck in quickly, and wounded Troglodyte in his soft neck, with a rock like a millstone, so that darkness veiled his eyes. Thereat Archimedes was seized with grief, and struck out with his sharp reed, and did not draw his spear back to him again, but felled his enemy there and then. And Lickman shot at him with a bright spear, and hit him unerringly in the midriff. And as he marked Cabbage Eater running away, he fell on the steep bank, yet even so did not cease fighting, but smote that other so that he fell and did not rise again. And the lake was dyed with red blood as he lay outstretched along the shore, pierced through the guts and shining flanks. Also he slew Cheese Eater on the very brink. But Reedy took to flight when he saw Ham Nibbler, and fled, plunging into the lake and throwing away his shield. Then Blameless Pot Visitor killed Brewer, and Waterlarked killed the Lord Ham Nibbler, striking him on the head with a pebble, so that his brains flowed out at his nostrils, and the earth was bespattered with blood. Faultless Muck Coucher sprang upon Lick Bladder and killed him with his spear, and brought darkness upon his eyes. And Leaky saw it, and dragged Lick Platter by the foot, though he was dead, and choked him in the lake. But Crumb Snatcher was fighting to avenge his dead comrades, and hit Leaky before he reached the land, and he fell forward at the blow, and his soul went down to Hades. And seeing this, the cabbage climber took a clod of mud and hurled it at the mouse, plastering all his forehead and nearly blinding him. Thereat Crumb Snatcher was enraged, and caught up in his strong hand a huge stone that lay upon the ground, a heavy burden for the soil. With that he hit Cabbage Climber below the knee, and splintered his whole right shin, hurling him on his back in the dust. But Croak Person kept him off, and rushing at the mouse in turn, hit him in the middle of the belly, and drove the whole reed spear into him, and as he drew the spear back to him with his strong hand, all his foe's bowels gushed out upon the ground. And when Troglodyte saw the deed, as he was limping away from the fight on the river bank, he shrank back sorely moved, and leaped into a trench to escape sheer death. Then Bread Nibbler hit Puffjaw on the toes. He came up at the last from the lake, and was greatly distressed. And when Leaky saw him fallen forward, but still half alive, he pressed through those who fought in front, and hurled a sharp reed at him, but the point of the spear was stayed, and did not break his shield. Then noble Rufal, like Ares himself, struck his flawless headpiece made of four pots. He only among the frogs showed prowess in the throng. But when he saw the other rush at him, he did not stay to meet the stout-hearted hero, but dived down into the depths of the lake. Now there was one among the mice, Slice Snatcher, who excelled the rest, dear son of Nar, the son of blameless bread-stealer. He went to his house, and bade his son take part in the war. This warrior threatened to destroy the race of frogs utterly, and splitting a chestnut husk into two parts along the joint, put the two hollow pieces as armor on his paws. Then straightway the frogs were dismayed, and all rushed down to the lake, and he would have made good his boast, for he had great strength, had not the son of Cronos, the father of men and gods, 
been quick to mark the thing and pitied the frogs as they were perishing. He shook his head and uttered this word. Dear, dear, how fearful a deed do my eyes behold! Slice Snatcher makes no small panic, rushing to and fro among the frogs by the lake. Let us then make all haste and send warlike Pallas, or even Ares, for they will stop his fighting, strong though he is. So said the son of Cronos, but Hera answered him, Son of Cronos, neither the might of Athena nor of Ares can avail to deliver the frogs from utter destruction. Rather, come and let us all go to help them, or else let loose your weapon, the great and formidable titan-killer, with which you killed Capenius, that doughty man, and great Enceladus, and the wild tribes of giants, aye, let it loose, for so the most valiant will be slain. So said Hera, and the son of Cronos cast a lurid thunderbolt. First he thundered, and made great Olympus shake, and then cast the thunderbolt, the awful weapon of Zeus, tossing it lightly forth. Thus he frightened them all, frogs and mice alike, hurling his bolt upon them. Yet even so, the army of the mice did not relax, but hoped still more to destroy the brood of warrior frogs. Only the son of Cronos on Olympus pitied the frogs, and then straightway sent them helpers. So there came suddenly warriors with mailed backs and curving claws, crooked beasts that walk sideways, nutcracker jawed, shell hided, bony they were, flat backed, with glistening shoulders and bandy legs and stretching arms and eyes that looked behind them. They had also eight legs and two feelers, persistent creatures who are called crabs. These nipped off the tails and paws and feet of the mice with their jaws, while spears only beat on them. Of these the mice were all afraid, and no longer stood up to them, but turned and fled. Already the sun was set, and so came the end of the One Day War. End of Section 9 End of Homeric Hymns, Epigrams, and Battle of Frogs and Mice by Homer. Translated by Hugh G. Evelyn White.